Welcome to the February 26, 2024 Special Board of Education meeting. Uh, at this time, please take a moment to silence your cell phone, turn off any ringers, and then join me in the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Mr. Hatfield, can you take roll, please? Absolutely. Uh, President Rausch? Here. Vice President McFarland? Here. Secretary Hatfield is here. Treasurer Lauterbach? Here. Member Blazy? Here. Member Ringgold? Here. Member Horowitz? Present. Everyone's here. Right. At this time, act, uh, agenda item number two is request to address the board. Anybody wish to address the board at this time? Welcome. Greetings. In the initial release of the agenda for this meeting, candidate number six was listed as Chief Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Officer at his school. In a revised version of the agenda, candidate number six was listed as Deputy Chief of Schools. The term deputy does not appear on the page for any of the nine people reporting to that superintendent. The candidate school website also lists number six as Chief Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Officer. At the selection meeting, Phil said he was the deputy chief of equity, not schools, which I'm guessing is what was on the candidate's resume. Therefore, I would like to officially ask if the board is guilty of feeding disinformation to the citizens of Midland by deleting the equity and DEI areas of responsibility. I use the number six designation intentionally as this issue is not related to the actions of the candidate, but to a local behavior. I wish the board good luck this evening and hope you don't focus on a single issue but on maintaining or improving the well-balanced strengths you so proudly claim. Thank you. Is there anybody else that would like to address the board at this time? Okay, that takes us to item number three, which are Board of Education Matters and candidate interviews for the superintendent position. Tonight we'll be interviewing three candidates. Uh, for the, the position of superintendent. Um, just to let everybody in the room know, as Dave sets up, each candidate, we're trying to keep uh, questions from the Board of Education to the candidates okay. limited to approximately 50, 50 minutes, so that the candidates have about 10 minutes to ask us questions. We've built in about a 15 minute buffer in between candidates to take a break, and if we go over a little bit, uh, in the room, um, you should have a QR code that you can use to provide feedback on the interviews and each of the candidates. Um, if you don't, they are just outside the door, so please grab one. As we go through this process, uh, the board would like to collect as much public feedback as possible um, on each of the candidates, their strengths and weaknesses as we go through that process. Um, if you are watching at home online, please feel free to shoot us an email at the Board of Education email address so that we can get that information into us as well. Um, and then finally, the, uh, the candidates will have about 10 minutes at the end of each of their interview time slots to get uh, questions, to ask questions of the Board of Education in addition. Um, I guess before we bring in the first candidate, any of the board members have any questions or points of clarification on tonight? In, in our interview packet, um, I'll ask the first two questions probably just as one question, and then um, I'll just go to my left and go all the way around. Dave has set the timer to 60 minutes just so we can kind of keep mental note of where we're at in the evening. And I've included kind of some generalized uh, or suggested um, times for for each of the each of the um, each of the the uh, categories. Hi, Laura. Nice to meet you. Hey, Patrick Scott McFarland. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Thank you, Patrick. Okay. 
And Patrick, do you have a list of the questions in front of you? Awesome. Unless I took the wrong seat, maybe. No, nope, you're all set. There you go. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, it's a pleasure to host you for interviews and look forward to hearing more from you tonight. Um, I was just telling the public that tonight we have about 50 minutes of questions to ask you. So we're going to kind of watch that clock on your side just to keep ourselves on task sure um, and then we're gonna try and leave 10 minutes at the end okay. for you to ask us questions and then uh, the, the list of questions in front of you um, are provided just so you don't have to ask us to repeat and you can follow along so appreciate it um, so please introduce yourself to, to us in the public share some of the some information on your background strengths and current and work experiences and then why are you interested in this position at the Midland Public Schools? Sure first uh, let me thank you all for the opportunity to interview for this position I know what a big responsibility is for any Board of Education to hire a superintendent and so to be selected as a candidate here um, is, a, is a real honor. Um, my experience uh, in education um, goes back to Niles Michigan in the the early 2000s uh, when I started as a teacher uh, of history and psychology in Niles Community Schools. It's a, it's a suburban um, urban district um, just north of, of South Bend, Indiana. And um, while during in that work I only taught for, for five years but uh, proud of the fact that I expanded um, the AP psychology sections from one to three while, while there um, and ensured that 100 percent of my students sat for the AP exam by um, um, through incentives and supports to make sure the students were there. Um, my efforts were, were recognized uh, by a new superintendent who come to the district who asked me to leave the classroom to help him start a new school within a school uh, called Niles New Tech Entrepreneurial Academy. And, um, and I took that opportunity, um, unlike any other, uh, as a five-year veteran teacher to leave the, the classroom to hire a team of teachers to start a new school within a a, a small community uh, was quite the experience and formative for me um, as it taught me um, a lot about school design and recruiting. Um, I, I had the charge of, of working with the business community to raise, uh, we had to raise about a half million dollars for some facility updates. Uh, we redesigned the school. This was back um, in the early days of one-to-one -one technology and so there was a technology component to the work. Um, and um, and it's where I, I formed my, my desire to really work closely with the community in order to help it achieve its goals and outcomes. I was only in that role for, for a year uh, before the opportunity to, uh, to move to Midland um, to be closer to my wife's and my family. She and I both grew up in the Bay City area. And when I learned that Meridian was looking for a new principal of their high school, and they um, had also um, recently received $2.5 million in um, corporate and Dow Family Foundation grants in order to help it reimagine teaching and learning. Um, it was a good fit for me, um, having just done similar work on a, on a different scale, and Niles to come up here and do the same for Meridian. And uh, that was in 2012, and as the story goes, um, shortly after coming to Meridian, uh, we learned of the, um, the early middle college work that had been brewing at the time um, in Michigan. Uh, there was a memo that the state superintendent had put out saying that he was looking to expand opportunities. Um, and, uh, and we saw that as a really positive fit and working with our Board of Education and the community um, as a small rural district not able to offer the wide range of IB and, and AP courses as you all are. Uh, we, we needed that advanced pathway for students and so we went all in the, the first and uh, only for um, for, for 10 years, uh, full school, early middle college, and a comprehensive high school like that uh, to be able to offer every student. And so um, when I left Meridian in 2019, uh, we were uh, graduating 80% of students with a year of, of college credit before graduating high school. And 10% of the students there uh, were earning an associate's degree or 60 transferable credits before they left. And so um, in my last two years at Meridian, I was asked to take on an assistant superintendent responsibility to help the board and superintendent think about how we expand 
uh, that that vision that we had had for the high school across the entire district K-12. And uh, we were able to do that, providing professional development for all teachers, um, uh, as well as um, rebranding the district and, and just talking more about the work. Um, during the time that I was there, we passed two bonds. The first was a technology infrastructure bond. Uh, the second was uh, the addition of a um, of auditorium and a, and a gymnasium as well as additional classrooms because you know and in fact um, you may have saw, saw in the news in the last year they're trying to add additional classrooms because um, as a result of all of the goodwill that we were able to create over the eight years that I was there um, we were able to reverse a, a decade-long decline in student enrollment in that rural community uh, so that right now they're they're actually growing um, which is a, a huge point of pride for them and a uh, good cause for celebration so I've been with Bay City now for five years and of course I, I started working there in an effort to um, to test some theories that I had about education on a larger scale. Um, I, I loved the Sanford Meridian community, uh, wonderful people out there, wonderful school district, um, but I, I wanted to test myself and see if uh, see how the things that uh, I had applied would work in a larger, more complex system. And then of course the pandemic hit seven months after getting there and, and a lot of us as, as you all uh, can attest to our, our work fundamentally shifted, but as a result of um, the the ESSER funds and just the opportunities to talk about student needs that have resulted from um, from that we've we've been able to make some fundamental shifts and in, in solving some equity challenges that have long existed in Bay City so uh, as many of you probably know Bay City is a 260 square mile district that's largely split in the middle um, near the river uh, with two feeder patterns, one that goes into Central High School made up of 100% uh, Title I schools and one that feeds into Western High School. Um, so it really is two different communities with two different levels of needs. And so um, I take a lot of pride in the fact, and of course, a lot of questions on here, so I'll try to wrap this up, but and hopefully get to some of the details of the work I've done in Bay City later on. But um, just take a lot of pride in the fact that we've been able to equitably distribute the, those funds in a way that uh, matches the level of need within the community, because as we know, um, the, the pandemic impacted students uh, disproportionately, and those that were most negatively impacted were the students uh, who, who weren't in the greatest uh, condition before the pandemic started in the first place. And so so if, maybe just in one minute, Patrick, if you can answer, uh, like, why, why interested in this role? Why Midland Public Schools as yeah. superintendent? Yeah, I appreciate it. I, I've, uh, I lived here for 10 years. Um, and, and being an educator, living within um, the city of Midland and sending my kids to your school district while working elsewhere has provided me just enormous amounts of respect. I've, uh, not only for the school district and the system, but for the community at large. It's, it's one of the most supportive places um, I can imagine, probably definitely in the state, probably um, in the nation in terms of, of resources and availability of, of um, activities for youth and, and I would love to be a part of that. I, I think professionally also, um, just knowing the, the challenges that you all have in front of you and knowing the, the path that I've taken throughout my career while in different communities, whether they be rural or urban or suburban, um, I, I think that there's a really good opportunity right now for me to come in and help you all solve some of these, these challenges that you know, hopefully we can get to later on in the interview as well. So. All right. <clears throat> what strategies have you used or will you use to balance your time in the district versus visibility in the community? Yeah, when I think about strategies that I have used in the past, um, and, and again, um, would also utilize as your superintendent, um, I, I think about them in two different ways. The first being formal. Uh, I think it's crucially important for any superintendent um, and, and someone in an executive leadership position like myself to, um, to establish formal lanes of communication and connection with the community. So for example, um, I uh, twice a month conduct uh, what we call school learning tours where we take a small group of principals into a school and we visit classrooms and we allow the school to present to us uh, the good things that are happening in that school. And after we visit the classrooms, we write thank you notes to the teachers and we leave post-it notes with positive celebrations of what we saw and we ask the principal to leave those celebrations in the teacher's lounge for everybody to see to make sure that we have these positive experiences. 
And while a lot of that is about just celebrating the success of our schools, it really is just a way to get me into schools and classrooms in a way that uh, on a regular basis and get other leaders into classrooms in a way that feels non-threatening to our staff, right? Um, there's a lot of times when your superintendent or chief academic officer walks into a classroom and it changes the dynamic and we're trying to break down those barriers and make it more, um, more accessible. Other formal ways of connecting with the community is, um, um, is, is making sure that uh, we, we host uh, in Bay City regular uh, what we call um, business and leadership, um, uh, sorry, business and community leader uh, summits. Uh, we hold them approximately quarterly. And uh, those are well attended events, approximately um, 50 to 75 participants. We'll hold them at schools or at, um, at the Double Tree there in Bay City um, as a way to have conversations with our, our business community about what they want for, uh, for students and how they believe schools should shift in order to better address the needs um, that they have. In addition to that, we hold parent roundtables. Um, we have uh, whenever we uh, have a proposed initiative, we put together a task force um, that looks deeply at the, the, the challenges. Um, and so, so there's a lot of formal structures, uh, not, not the informal, right? There's also, it's very important for any superintendent, any district leader to be, uh, to be present, uh, fully present at uh, celebrations, at events, at athletic competitions, uh, in the schools. Um, with Bay City being so large, uh, I do a lot of driving around the district. Um, I don't make my principals come to me if I meet with them. I want to go to them. And when I meet with them, I, I want to walk the halls. I want to say hello to the teachers that I see. I want to try to recognize people that are go doing good work. Uh, I want to be present at professional development and, and participating. And my team pushes me to make sure that I'm leading sessions because uh, you, you have to see your leadership uh, out front. Um, and so right now we're working with with teachers to develop leadership capacity as part of our professional development plans. Um, I'm also a member of Rotary. Um, I've, I have been for about a year and a half, which I think is important uh, in order to keep me connected with, with that segment of the business community. I'm a regular attendee at Chamber of Commerce events, um, and, and I'm happy to present and talk about the good work that's happening at Bay City Public Schools with anybody who's willing to have me. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think you're you're seeing. I'm a talker. Um, it, it's not it's not challenging to get me to uh, to gab, um, whether it's one on one or in a group like this. Um, I'm I'm good at presenting information to, to folks. Um, I the longer I've been in education, um, the more I have have worked at, at listening first in order to. Make sure that what I'm what I'm what I'm saying back to the person is resonating in, in a helpful way. Uh, we do a lot of that um, in Bay City Public Schools when we bring people together. We try to learn with them and listen to what they say, and then communicate what we call key takeaways from from our group interactions with them. So that way we can create that resonance um, with them. And so by establishing again formal channels of communication in a district of this size or in the size of Bay City, it's just really important for us to think about how we're formally communicating with people. So we have regular newsletters um, and we include um, these key takeaways. Uh, when we've got a group that's working on a specific initiative, what are the takeaways of that? Um, make sure that they make their way into our newsletters and get communicated out. Um, we, uh, we work with our director of communications in order to make sure that um, that these messages get get communicated out not only in newsletters but we also have a um, we've been making over the last uh, two years um, video what I'll call documentaries about important work where we try to capture uh, teacher and student voices about the work that's happening in schools um, and then we put those up on our website and on our social media feeds and then we also use them for, for, for professional development. Um, I think that there's no better way of, of communicating out the work that's happening in schools than, than getting students and teachers to tell the story in their own voices. Um, and so that's become a huge part of our communication strategy. Um, 
how will I achieve transparency without exhausting stakeholders with information? Um, I don't have any problem being vulnerable, and I think that that's, uh, that's really important to any community to see that their leader um, is, is able to, to say things in plain language the way that they are and to own when things aren't going well as, as long as you balance that with a commitment to doing what's best for kids. Um, I think that the community responds to that. So um, I think without being overly exhaustive and using educational jargon, uh, we, can, we can connect well with our community and, and listen to them to meet their needs. What a question. So um, I'm a firm believer, um, I'll say it this way, the one thing that I've learned to appreciate in all of my years of leadership is that the only thing that can ensure student success is the quality of the teacher that's in front of them. Um, as important as the work that happens in this room and, and uh, down the hall in the superintendent's office. Um, all of that needs to be in service of making sure that uh, teachers can do their job in order to educate uh, students and that support systems and structures are in place so that when students um, uh, struggle that they don't fall through the cracks. Uh, we have to have a, a tiered and systematic approach to how we support students when they struggle, but at the very base of it, our core teaching practices, our tier one instruction have to be um, have to be sound. And I think that it's the, the role of the, the, the school district to make sure the teachers have the, the resources, the training, uh, the confidence in order to be able to do that that well. Yeah, right now um, in, in Bay City Public Schools, we have, um, we have an intervention task force that uh, was launched about three weeks ago. Um, sorry, uh, they're, they're currently had their third meeting, so they're probably about six weeks in um, at, at this point. And we're asking key questions about um, the fact that our tier one instruction is, is first and foremost um, not sufficiently addressing all of the student needs on the east side of town in our, our higher poverty schools. And so, um, so the first thing that we've done is that we have um, redesigned the, the teaching plan. We've provided all teachers with a uniform um, instructional model uh, to be able to, to address those needs. Uh, we've also, um, I'll talk a little bit specifically about Handy Middle School. Um, in 2021, recognizing that uh, the students in that school um, were, uh, during the pandemic and remote learning, we had about 50% of students um, not attending school on a regular basis. And so and when, when we brought, uh, came back uh, into school and we're looking at how to spend our ESSER funds, uh, we realized that those same groups of students um, have historically struggled in the community uh, going back nearly a decade, despite the fact that as a Title I school, we were spending about $750,000 a year on additional supports and interventions for those kids. And so that circumstance warranted a fundamental redesign and a shift in how we were providing education in that school. And so I worked with our Board of Education in August of 21 and asked them to pass a resolution to put together a task force to look at the design of that school and to suggest recommendations for their December meeting. And while as Chief Academic Officer, I didn't need the board uh, permission to put a task force together, we thought collectively that it was important for us to have that public signal to the community that, that we, we see this as an urgent matter. Um, if any of you know Bay City Handy has a, a long history of, of, of challenges within the community and perceptual struggles. And um, as a as someone who attended Handy Middle School uh, in 1990 in the first uh, class of sixth graders to go through, uh, it was, I'm proud of the fact that we've been able to make some fundamental shifts in that school. And so one of the things that we've done there is that we're, we've, we've repurposed their Title I uh, money in order to provide every teacher uh, with, um, with what we call team time. 
Um, it's a time that they can collaborate. Uh, so every teacher teaches four out of six periods instead of the five out of six periods. They have one individual prep and one team times uh, because as we know, teaching in a high poverty school, um, it requires a, a ton of resources um, and a ton of uh, energy from the teachers. And when we talked to teachers, they were exhausted at the end of every day. They were dealing with a very high risk population and, um, and that was one of the solutions. That comes out of the, um, the middle school design uh, models, the national models of, of good um, middle school design and um, we uh, we implemented that along with a, um, a an inquiry based instructional model uh, train teachers for 18 days over the summer in order to turn the school around so I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself but I just think it's important for you to get the context and so while well I don't think that, that story about handy middle school necessarily applies to any of the challenges that that uh, that Midland faces uh, what I hope is that it shows uh, demonstrates just my, my ability to work with a community, bring a task force together to initiate change when student um, achievement is, is below where we want it to be and to make those changes and, and support teachers effectively uh, towards fidelity. So. I think you kind of answered this one, but we're going to go with it anyway. What approach would you take to address and remedy achievement gaps between schools within the district? Yeah, yeah I think when, whenever gaps exist, um, it's important for us to, um, to bring a large stakeholder group together in order to analyze that data. Uh, a frequent conversation I have with my principals um, when they will come to me with a, a gap in data um, that they see as being is needing attention is I encourage them to get a group of a, a broader group of educators and parents uh, together in order to look at that data together. Um, I believe that the more inclusive we can be in our approach to um, hearing uh, different ideas of people at different levels of the organization as well as parents and students, the more uh, likely we'll, we will be to find um, suitable solutions for, for the long term. Um, when we when we did the redesign work at at Handy Middle School, we brought together a stakeholder group of of approximately 35 people that consisted of parents and students, uh, pr predominantly teachers, as well as administrators, union leaders. Um, we met about once every two weeks to maintain momentum. Uh, we took that group um, on on buses to Reynoldsburg, Ohio, to see an innovative school, and to um, and to Owensboro, Kentucky, and so. The needs of the, the school were, were so high and the, the gaps were so wide that we knew we had to do something, um, uh, something there in order to address those needs. Next question. How will you bring community organizations and governmental agencies together with the school district to create a healthier working and collaborative partnership for the good of the district and the community? I think being as direct and upfront about your goals uh, for bringing people together, um, the better. Uh, one of the things that strikes me um, in having, having watched um, a good number of your board meetings and, um, and, and spent time you know, researching the, the district is just how powerful uh, your, your mission and vision is. And, and one of the questions that, 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 that I would have for community organizations and governmental agencies is, is how, that, how that aligns, right? And, and where those specific parts of your vision um, uh, do align, whether it's related to uh, the goal of leadership or the, the culture or achievement. Um, I, I think that those types of conversations tend to resonate uh, deeply with people. So um, one of the ways that I've been successful in the past is when I meet with groups, um, whether they be governmental agencies or community organizations, um, I try to listen to them about their collective um, needs uh, so that when we partner with them, um, we're able to, um, to do so in a way that meets both, um, both sides' needs um, in, in order to create those collaborations. So uh, again, because the work of running a school district is challenging, I believe in having formal structures in place, regular meetings with these folks, as well as being present in the community and at events so that way um, um, I can connect with these folks on a regular basis in order to keep the, the district and community connected. Thank you. Mm -hmm. How have you held your leadership team or staff accountable for their roles and responsibilities? Please provide any examples. Hmm. Sure. Um, 
as a chief academic officer, I supervise um, all of our district administrators. Um, there are 24 of them, and, and certainly leading through a pandemic, there were uh, plenty of opportunities for, um, for challenges that came up. Um, and then, of course, uh, within the organization, um, I run the academic side of the, uh, of the house, and so I've got a, a large team of, of support staff that, um, that support everything from testing to, uh, to media centers to curriculum support. Um, and we're also responsible for, um, um, for, for the state and federal grant programs. And so uh, Bay City received about $35 million in, in, in ESSER funds, and then we've got about a, a seven to $10 million annual budget in, in, um, in other grants. And so the amount of opportunities in Bay City for, for challenges to come up in those circumstances um, can, be, can be challenging. When my leadership team has struggled, um, I've addressed them first and foremost as directly as possible as a, as a leader myself. Um, I know that that's the way that they want to be communicated with. Um, there have been times when community members will um, come to board members, board members will bring challenges to me, um, and I will try my best to bring that information directly to the, the, the school leaders so that way they hear it directly and can respond to it um, themselves. When challenges go unmet, um, I, I use more formal methods. Um, we, um, we have a challenge right now um, regarding graduation requirements um, in the district um, where I have, have directed our administrators to, to do uh, a deep dive into what's happening with our transcript audit processes and, um, and, and we're working together, right? I think that that starts with a conversation about what's going on and then I put things in writing to make sure that they happen and then um, I've given them a deadline of May 1st to get back to me with a resolution to the problem. Um, most challenges, of course, are, are handled rather, um, rather informally, um, but whenever we have to address a formal issue, um, we, we certainly um, can do that as well. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> Aging infrastructure is a concern. Older and outdated buildings across the district need attention and renovations. As a superintendent, what is the best way to approach this topic with the community? How do you determine what the needs are and what the community will support in regard to passing a bond? I was fascinated by the presentation provided um, by Brian Bruton in December. Um, the, the, I'd heard of the, the facility study happening throughout uh, the last year um, through colleagues um, and, and knew of the, uh, the work was ha that was happening. And it, it's um, the, the amount of intentionality that's gone into that process and looking and analyzing the, the various needs is, is admirable. Uh, I think that where the, um, where, where the need is at this point clearly is reaching out to the community to, to, to get some direction. And, and having those conversations. And it's, it's one of the things that intrigues me most about um, the potential of working with you all is that throughout my career, I've had multiple opportunities to uh, come into a place when a board of education needs to have a crucial conversation about important work to happen in the district. And I've been able to listen to the community and, um, and, and package their, their thoughts and input in such a way and communicate it back to them that resonates so that when the district that I've worked for makes a move in that direction, um, the community goes along with it. And I, I can't think of any better um, um, example of that than a, than a bond measure to, uh, to address um, uh, historical needs in a, in a community. I think there's a lot of exciting stuff on the table that I think the community can really resonate around. Uh, the key will be, um, making sure that enough people have input so that um, we don't get too far out in front of ourselves and, and put something out there that the community doesn't actually, um, doesn't actually want. Um, I've been involved in, in four um, uh, bond initiatives, um, one unsuccessful at Meridian, um, uh, one, the next one successful when we realized that the community just didn't want a turf football field, uh, that we'd, they'd have to find funding to do that in a different way. But I, I think it's that sort of learning uh, going through those processes um, that, that have, have led me to believe that um, really listening to and being involved in the community and having conversations as well as formal surveys and, and all the other channels, but making sure that you're, you know the pulse of that community and what they're thinking before you put that bond out there because uh, the, the improvements are essential. Um, 
the 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 role of the district is to um, is to to get it right and put out there what the community wants to wants to do. What's the level of involvement and participation of certain employees in organizational decisions, and how do you determine what groups to include and when? Yeah, if there's one lesson I've learned working for Bay City Public Schools, it's that we need everybody's voices at the table, from board members to union leaders um, to, to parents. Um, in, in leading uh, change work in Bay City, I found it important to, if I, if I get a phone call at the district uh, from a parent who's got concerns about a direction we're heading, I frankly invite them to a committee meeting. Uh, I want to hear their voices. I want to be a part of it. I believe that we're, we're currently living in a time um, in an era where um, certain groups f are feeling like their voices aren't being heard and so i think including them as much as possible is really important and so when it comes to employee groups um uh, i you know i've i've again i i led in bay city during a, a time a, a challenging time as i know it was for all of you as well um where there not every minute was was glowing and wonderful um, but in the end we've we've negotiated um, successful contracts with with multiple groups in order to provide teachers and um, and paraprofessionals and transportation um, and custodial staff um, um, raises and, and increased insurance benefits um, uh, in order to make sure that um, uh, that we're we're working together with them and so um, whenever we bring together a task force that involves any instructional initiative or change uh, we involve the um, the teachers association to be a part of that conversation right out the gate uh, we don't want to catch them off guard with those um, with those conversations so um, very similar to my response to a former question we try to establish um, those formal communication channels at the same time um, um, i also have a a rather uh, informal level of of, of relationship with um, with the union leaders um, in order to make sure that we're 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 seeing problems and talking about them texting each other about them um, before they they come up and so if there's a problem in one of my schools then I want to know about it before it it reaches a grievance level in the HR office and so uh, in a place like Bay City that those types of informal communication channels tend to be very successful and and uh, I assume it's the same for a large organization like your own Yeah, I, I think 2012 um, transforming um, Meridian into an early middle college and, um, and transforming teaching and learning in a rural school district to a full project-based approach um, had its challenges. Um, I, I even remember the valedictorian, uh, the first year that I was there, his, his valedictorian speech was, um, was about how bad the changes we were making to the school would harm. And it wasn't until 2016, 2017, when we graduated our first cohorts of students with those numbers that I shared with you earlier, that the community uh, really, really came around and saw what we were, we were doing. I, I guess in fairness, it was 2014 when we first started sending kids to college in large numbers that the, that the community rallied behind us. Um, the, our initial response though was to invite people into the school, right? With any change initiative, especially with instruction, um, parents were struggling because the instruction we were providing in the school didn't look like anything that they remembered when they were in school. And so we opened the doors of the school. We provided uh, parent uh, training uh, so they could understand our um, our educational platform so they could check their kids' grades online. Um, but we also hosted, um, we had a group that I called Parent Voice. Um, students were also challenged um, with, with the change. And so um, I, I led a, um, a weekly group that I called Student Voice. Uh, where we just let people come in and tell us what they were feeling and try to address their challenges. Um, so th the combination of, of listening, of, of providing opportunities for people to see what we were doing and talking them through the vision. Um, but one of the most challenging things to do is to, to change something in a way that people can't see the end result. And so until they can, it's, it's very challenging. So um, yeah. again, uh, not necessarily um, the, the, the type of work that, um, that I, um, I see you all 
um, engaging in over the next few years, but it, just an example of how important it is to um, embrace people, to reinsure them, to, um, to bring them along on a journey with you when you make large change, uh, so that way um, they can be a part of it. And what, what do they say, that uh, uh, people don't mind change, they just hate change happening to them, right? They want to be brought along. So. Uh, there's another part of that question. I want to make sure. What would I do differently? Uh, I was I was pretty young in my administrative career. I think I would have um, I would have played down the the change work a little bit. I think that we got a little excited about how exciting how new things would be. Uh, I think that first cohort of students, um, school still looked like school in the end. You know, um, I think that because of the funding, because of the, the excitement of the teachers, we we put out there. To parents that it would that it would be so different and I think anytime you give something a label and call it something new it tends to be a little more scary so but oh thank you Brad um, switching gears just a little bit um, how do you view um, board superintendent relationships and how will you keep board members informed and communicate with us the relationship between the Board of Education and a superintendent is paramount to the success of a school district and it's the job of the superintendent to connect with each board member on an individual level to make sure that um, he or she is meeting the board's, uh, the individual board members' communication style and, and work patterns. Um, at the same time, uh, there are emergencies that come up and it's important for the superintendent to never um, to ensure that board members are never caught off guard by the community. So as challenges come up, making sure that board members are kept abreast. Um, of course, I'd be committed to providing um, you all with a, a weekly formal update on what's happening throughout the district and, and what um, my actions um, and, and dealings within the district are. Um, but on an informal um, level, it's important for um, for, for me and any board to stay, um, to stay in connection on a regular basis. Again, each board member has their own individual level of desire of involvement as well as availability. And so just making sure that um, as superintendent, I, I meet those needs. Um, the governance of the district is, is largely dependent upon that relationship between the board and the superintendent. And uh, the superintendent needs to make sure that the, the, the entire cabinet team is, as well as the administration across the district is in alignment with the goals and, and objectives and strategies that the board uh, would like in place. And so making sure that, that that alignment between the superintendent and the board is there first and foremost is, the, is, is arguably the most important thing that a superintendent can do. Great. Well, thank you, Mr. Malley, because that's all the, the prepared questions that we had at this time. But um, wanted to make sure we left time for you to ask us questions, and then maybe if there's still time, if any of the board members have follow-up sure. questions, um, take it from there. But. As I mentioned, it's it's um, basically we don't uh, – we don't have recorded board meetings, and so it's a uh, God bless you all. It's fascinating to be able to go back in time and watch board meetings, and so I feel like I've gotten to know uh, quite a bit about the district. But I did think it was important for me to ask you all what you see as the most um, pressing challenges that face the district, and and um, and how do you want your superintendent to to address them in the future? Um, maybe I'll start, and then I'll I'll look to my other board members to uh, to. To help out most pressing pressing challenge I think for us is how do we uh, continue our recovery from the COVID learning loss and in particular as we as a district as many others make a transition from ESSER funds and having to make sure we measure the success of individual ESSER programs which ones do we want to make sure are properly accounted for in our general fund bund budgets going forward yeah um, and furthermore how do we continue to really um, provide individual learning opportunities for each of our learners such that they're growing as as much as they possibly can throughout the school year um, whether that's through individualized um, interventions um, sure additional opportunities for them, summer school, um, but making sure that each of our students grows to their full potential um, with their families involved along the way. So, other 
board members want to add in? I guess building on what Phil just said, I think one of the biggest challenges is making sure that uh, we're addressing the gaps that we've identified uh, in student performance data across the district and moreover making sure that our buildings are coming into line with one another because we are starting to see differences between our high schools as sure. an example. And in a town like Midland, it's a, it's a bit concerning to see that. So. I would I would add aging infrastructure uh, yeah, and the need for to sure. address shortcomings at ver I w what I would say are critical shortcomings at at least one building, mm -hmm. uh, if not two, uh, and how we manage or how we plan uh, for the long term needs uh, as the birth rate continues to decline mm -hmm. uh, and. Uh, should there be two high schools? Yeah. Just put it right out there. That's, <laughs> I think that's <laughs> something that we need to talk about. So. Do your enrollment projections follow the state trends of approximately 2% per year and how far out? I mean, you guys have grown. Um, it, I shouldn't say that you've grown, but it's just that I've recognized that in my tenure at Bay City, we've crossed paths, right? There was a time where we were a larger school district than you all, and, and that's no longer the case. And uh, we, we believe we'll plateau at around 5,000 students. Um, and we were at 7,500 uh, just three years ago. Um, I, I don't see your decline being so great. Is it's, there, uh, it's, no. it's flattening. Good, but yeah, it's, okay. That's, it ain't going up. It's that's probably more, I'm looking at Brian, it's probably more of three quarters of a percent to a percent doing yeah. the numbers in my head but sure. we, uh, we've captured more and more of the kids born in Midland County yeah and there's not that many more to capture right <laughs> right so for sure yeah. yeah I think I would add and I don't know if this is, that this is necessarily a pressing challenge because we're already well down the path but I think we really want to continue our focus on early childhood literacy and literacy sure. right. in the younger years Well, thank you. Yeah, in Bay City, we've, uh, we're also recognizing the need for early childhood. Uh, we, we closed a community elementary school, uh, Lynn's Day, um, uh, a, a year and a half ago. And rather than uh, repurposing that in, in any other way, we, we turned it into an early childhood center just in recognition of, of how important uh, those services are. And we lease half the building out to, um, to our ISD and, and we uh, house our own programs out of the other half of the building. Um, and it was full in a heartbeat, you know. So we, we have two daycare facilities as well as um, early childhood and those, those have turned into um, essential needs for our community that, um, that we're, we're looking to, to further enhance. So um, what do you all see as your role of your superintendent helping you through these challenges? More challenging part of the question. I'm going to let the three to my right start. I think it's a very critical role. I mean, you yeah. are, you would, the, the superintendent is the tip of the spear. Yeah. Um, the superintendent is doing the work and meeting with the facility study committee, meeting with the different operational committees within the district, uh, the administrative cabinet, um, really leading the charge on change and innovation um, mm -hmm. and bringing a vision to the table and helping guide the board and counseling the board on making decisions. Thank you. I would add that I think it's very relationship based mm -hmm. um, and you kind of hinted at that in you know each of us has different communication styles and work patterns um, and same with the community right and and we're at this point where those relationships are imperative right. um, between the superintendent and us between superintendent and admin team between the district and the community mm -hmm. um, and and again you hit um, very clearly on how important it is to have those communication levels but I think it's also about relationship so yeah yeah and I I think again just as a someone who lived in and, and sent his children to Midland uh, public schools um, you you are very rich in formal uh, opportunities for folks to connect and to um, to, to receive information um, um, and and one of the things that, that, that 
throughout my career I've enjoyed doing it, you know whether it be from starting the new school in Niles or um, reimagining Meridian as an early middle college or redesigning Handy Middle School um, in Bay City is that in all of those instances I've worked with the community in order to listen to what their um, hopes and dreams and desires were for the school system um, so that I could communicate that back to them as a way of of mobilizing the community around a particular direction um, and towards a, a particular task um, and and you know I think one of the areas to highlight as well is just that um, in August we launched uh, what we call our graduate profile um, in response to the to the conversations that we've been having with the community about what they want for kids when they leave um, the school um, and we we worked with a communication company in order to create a, a, a graphic and a um, um, and a message that that resonates with the community that we want students to graduate from Bay City that are aware eligible and prepared for post-secondary readiness there's universal uh, agreement across the district in Bay City that that students need some form of post-secondary education or training before they graduate and the number of students who are successful in post-secondary education and training opportunities um, is far below where the community feels that they should be um, and so I think that a school district like Midland where you do have um, you do have a large population of affluent students and yet you do have you know a population of students who are at risk and then you've got those students right there in the middle um, I'm just I'm so struck by how resourceful um, you, you are in providing different pathways for students and I think that aligning those pathways in a coherent way that resonates with the community and making sure that it's all behind that general vision that you have um, can create a lot of power and potential I mean there are just so many wonderful things um, here that um, that those connections with the community and um, and again whether it is evaluating programs and saying hey wh what have we done during the pandemic that was successful and what are we going to stick around with or whether it's um, individualizing supports for high-risk kids or or whether it's early childhood programs or passing a, a major bond proposal um, all of those involve um, working with a community which is which is something I feel very confident in, in doing and I I hope uh, that don't want to assume uh, that I that I uh, that I get another interview but if if um, if if I do I'd love to continue this conversation about uh, talking to you about how we might be able to work together for the the, the kids and community here in Midland so Thank you. You said that you really enjoyed Mr. Bruton's presentation, yeah. which was a, a lot of a lot of work that went into that. But thank you for that. Um, a lot of information was presented in that. Um, whether we go with either one of the options that were presented, and we're not saying those are the only two options, sure. but that's information that we gathered. Um, How do you feel? Do you have any sticker shock if, if we are headed in the, in, in down the road of three hundred million dollars for a, a bond? Yeah, I, I'm a bad person to ask that question. Um, this that's an unfair question, actually. Uh, I, <laughs> I, here's what I think. I th I think that. Um, the, the growth in Larkin, um, the, the need for one of those solutions, the age of Northeast. I mean, I think you guys have got a very compelling rational case for people. I think the challenge is going to be uh, connecting with people on a personal level and seeing where, where they are. Um, my, my oldest, uh, who goes to Dow High, is a sophomore, right? And so if I were to reach out to families, um, a lot of their kids are going to be graduating. What are they going to vote? Right. I think we, we need to talk to people with kindergartners or the younger kids and uh, not to mention, I mean, just the, the community here has always supported the school district. But what that dollar amount is really is going to be based upon the, the need and what people are willing to part with in their, their taxes. And so uh, there, there's there's no greater ask of a community than uh, than than that. And so they need to be able to see the vision for it. Um, there's a ton of pride in uh, Chemex and um, um, see, I don't even remember what your uh, chargers. And char yeah, chargers. So um, there's a lot of pride. It goes to Dow, huh? <laughs> <laughs> it's a microphone that does it, guys. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll blame it. What, what can I possibly blame for getting that? Out? My kid won't forgive me now. So um, uh, neither will his baseball coach. But um, we, um, yeah, there's just a ton of pride in this community for those schools, and there's so much history with students. I mean, I just remember living within a. Um, within a, a Midland High community, be 
um, impartial and listen to the community to head in a direction with you all that needs to be headed in versus being, uh, I mean, let's I've been in leadership for a long time. It's very easy to fall in love with your ideas, right? And so uh, I think you're at a time right now where you, you need somebody to, um, to, with a cooler head to kind of help, help the leadership team uh, make that decision. Not that you don't have an already incredibly cool head <laughs> administrative team here. A uh, very impressive group of individuals that can um, that can think those things through. Uh, very very competent group. But um, but at the same time, um, I think that the, the the value I bring y'all is just being able to come come and connect relationally and and formally with the community to to help help make all of these very important decisions. So. So also part of that whole presentation that we uh, put out to the community that Brian presented was putting pre-K programs back in all of the neighborhood uh, elementary schools. Yeah. Does that challenge you or intrigue you to, to go that route as well? Uh, it, as a retention strategy for students, it's intriguing, right? People like to be a part of their community school versus sending their kid to an early childhood center. From a programming standpoint, having an early childhood center is very appealing, right? So it depends on what you're designing for, right? If, if, if what the community is asking for is that the, the, the pre-K programs are back in their community elementary school, then, then you can provide an essential service, but it makes it more challenging uh, for those teachers for both professional development, that they're now scattered across the entire district versus in a, in a center. Um, there are merits to both. Uh, Bay City operates both models. We have a center and we, we try to provide, because again, for 260 square miles, it's really important to us to be able to provide um, early childhood as well as before and after care across our entire district, just because um, the community can't get all of their kids to one campus. But, uh, but I could make a very strong argument for a center-based program just because of the, the, the ease of professional development and um, the, the, that staff being, being together all the time. about trade-offs right I mean it's a lot of a lot of what this work is there's no there's no right answer to any of these questions um, and you're gonna have strong opinions on both sides and the key is is just listening to people and weighing them and um, and heading in the direction that's going to get the most um, um, the, the most support um, while also staying true to the ideas that you're trying to, to foster as a, as a community so so as a as an MPS parent and given your background as chief academic officer from an academic standpoint, are there any changes you would make to MPS? If so, what would they be? I would want to learn a ton more before I would even suggest a change. I, I, I remember attending my first IB um, meeting when my, my son was still at Seabird Elementary and being so intrigued. I mean, the, the work that you guys are doing is so aligned already with, um, with the path that, that I've been on philosophically as an educator. Um, Inquiry-based instruction is is in in great need right now. I think anything that we can do to um, ensure that students not only know the facts and figures but also can think critically and solve problems. Um, I don't want to send students to be engineers at the University of Michigan because they get really high test scores to find out that they they can't actually solve a practical problem once they get there. And so, uh, and so I I think it's crucially important. So I'm. Uh, whether it be your STEM programs, whether it be your international baccalaureate programs. Um, and again, your achievement scores um, are some of the best in the state. Um, I think that the challenges are providing appropriate tiered supports for students that, that have needs um, and, and continuing to invest in that international baccalaureate work. Um, the, the, the DEI work um, is essential in order to make sure that um, that funds are equitably going to where they need to go and that the voices of the community are being being included to make sure that marginalized communities are being addressed um, and um, yeah I, I would I would not suggest at this early venture uh, any change to the to the academic programs I think one of the things that has been so essential to my role is that again as a chief academic officer um, I'm responsible for professional development of staff. I'm, pro I'm responsible for, um, for budgets. I'm responsible for um, supervising, making sure programs are effective and running accordingly. But at the end of the day, all of that is in service of making sure that my teachers are getting, getting better and getting the resources that they need to be able to impact students on a daily basis. And so um, I think that continuing to do that and just also knowing that their, their work has gotten immensely harder over the last three to five years. And so whatever we can do in order to um, make sure that they can continue to focus on students is, is of crucial importance to me. So. 
I have one question in regards to, you know, looking at PD and budget and effective programs. Mm -hmm. um, what are some examples of um, data measurement that you have been using um, currently? Uh, in, in the context of, of academic mm -hmm. performance? So uh, I'll, t I'll give you two examples, um, just because I think one is, one is large scale district level, and then um, I'll try to boil down where we, where we try to get to. Um, whenever, we try to be as holistic as possible. So um, every year I give, um, I, I give a, a culture survey to students, staff, and parents, where we have, uh, it's called Youth Truth, it's given by a national nonprofit mm -hmm. organization, and it gives us a pulse on, on the culture of the school district. And uh, that, that instrument allows us to, um, to dig into the data to see how the culture is, is being impacted. If you are um, a, a student who's experienced poverty, if, if you're, um, um, if, if you're, you're black, white, or, or Hispanic, if you are a, a male or a female, um, um, identify as male or female. And so we can, we can see what the experience of school is for all those different marginal groups, so that way we're able to um, create, create action plans uh, to address them. And so what I do in order to, to analyze that data is I bring groups of principals and teachers together through our, our continuous improvement process, and we look at that data alongside our, our academic performance data. Uh, last month, we, we were analyzing our, um, our, our SAT and our, our MSTEP scores. We were looking at growth in addition to achievement, just as you all have been doing at your, your board level. And, um, and we are designing our interventions and our plans in accordance with that. Um, of particular importance to us in Bay City right now is our, our attendance um, and discipline data are, are through the roof and we're putting in interventions in order to make sure and social emotional supports for kids and make sure that those numbers go down because we know that those things are related, right? If students attend school more and they um, get into trouble less, then we, we will see our academic achievement increase. And so um, I, I have a, uh, throughout my career, I've been very fortunate to have been trained heavily in um, and the use of protocols and, and leading and facilitating groups of, of adults and looking at data intentionally to make sense of it. Educators are not necessarily wired in that way. And so um, one of the things I try to do is um, I look at data first on my own and then I try to um, use protocols to allow other people to do it as well. Rather than me giving a presentation to my principals or teachers about the data, I would rather facilitate their own learning of the data so that they can make their own sense um, and then be a part of the of the informing the plans for how we're going to respond to it, um, and that, that's one of the ways that we we prevent ourselves from being top down. Uh, the other example I want to provide is that um, uh, I think in t 2020 we implemented an initiative in Bay City that we call collaborative learning cycles, and we worked with our teachers union to get this written into um, our, our teachers contract where. Every teacher spends um, one to two Mondays after school per month um, in, in a group that they call collaborative learning cycles. And we have um, engaged and trained 15% uh, of the teaching staff, about 75 teachers, um, in, in training to facilitate this learning. Excuse me, and we use a cyclical learning process as a part of that where we ask teachers to identify a specific area of student focus and uh, that they want to see improve. So for example, if third grade teachers want to see student writing improve, that's their area of focus. We ask them to, to select a strategy that they're going to all employ as a group to improve writing and then meet, uh, commit to, to the next time they meet, bringing back data on, on student writing. And what we've been trying to do with teachers, which is, which is challenging, some groups um, it's really easy for, but others, uh, I, th I just think as educators, again, we get ahead of ourselves sometimes where um, they constantly, they, when we say data, we think of like the big data. Sometimes data is just the sample of student writing. Like let's just have kids bring the writing to the next meeting, you know? And so we, we try to make data as small as possible because it, it, when it comes to making sure students can write, we need to be talking professionally about the quality of students writing so let's all just bring samples of the writing and talk about it and then and then uh and, and so a lot of our professional development and training for staff is just to let's just let's just get down to brass tacks here and talk about exactly what we're trying to do um and and not think that every piece of data that we talk about has to be this this high-minded state test because the state test frankly is way too far away from teaching and learning what's happening in a classroom to be usable by a teacher um, but that student writing sample is so any other last questions for us? 
no, I think I've successfully used up my time here. So, uh, well, your, your consultant's done a great job with the, the logistics and the planning. And, um, and again, I, I just thankful for you all to give me the, uh, the time here today and just re really appreciative and, and so much respect for the work that you all do for the kids in this community. And, and I feel so, um, yeah, just honored to, uh, to have an opportunity to interview with you. So, well, thank you for applying and, and we really appreciate your time. Uh, I, it's stressful enough to interview, let alone do it publicly. Oh, yeah. So yeah. I have a lot of respect for, for you and, and anyone else that has to go through this process. So yeah. thank appreciate you. that. Yeah. Thank you. But happy to be here. Take care, guys. Okay, so maybe 10 minute break, I'm going to suggest, so we can start at 645. Thank you. 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 Thanks. Hello. Hello. Now my hands are wet from shaking. Yes, they are. It's good to see you. Well, welcome. Thank you for uh, thank you for applying and thank you for coming tonight. Thanks Ms. for Miller having Nelson. me here. Um, just to cover some logistics, quick. Uh, Sarah put in front of you oh, yeah. the 13 questions that the board has prepared to ask, with 13. some suggestions on potential timing. Um, if we finish early, as we did with the previous candidate, would love to have some just discussion back and forth questions that you have for us as well as any follow-up questions that we may have from our discussion um, the audience in the room does ha I'm going to re remind the audience that we do have a QR code so you can provide feedback on our discussion today and then if you're watching online please submit your feedback via email to the Board of Education via our, our uh, email address I'll ask the first two questions and then we'll go around the table um, from there on. So, Penny, please introduce yourself to the board and the public and then share information about your background, strengths, current and work experiences that uh, make you who you are. Absolutely. Thanks for having me here tonight. I'm very excited to be interviewing for this job. Uh, as you saw in my resume, I have been around a while. I, uh, I have been an educator my entire professional career. It, I am a teacher at heart, and I started my teaching career at Bertrand High School, where I was able to revitalize their agri-science natural resources program. I also taught uh, some science classes there. It was a phenomenal first teaching experience. I had tremendous mentorship from a high-quality principal and amazing veteran teachers who just wrapped around me and helped me be a better teacher every single day. It was also really a special experience because I was able to be an FFA advisor. And uh, if you're not familiar with that, it's a student leadership organization grounded in agriculture and natural resources. I was able to teach students leadership skills, career skills, travel with them to events and competitions, and as a young professional, it was such uh, an enriching experience to work with students outside of the classroom as well as inside of the classroom. I was afforded lots of opportunities to show my leadership skills well at Bertrand and was noticed by our county, the Saginaw County CTE Center. And at the time, the CTE Center was owned and operated by Saginaw Public Schools. And so I was welcomed to that team where I spent uh, eight years working in one of the most unique positions possible. I was a placement coordinator, a work-based learning coordinator. So it was really the best of two worlds. I worked directly with students in order to help them be ready to go out on work-based learning experiences. So I taught direct lessons on work readiness, uh, employability skills, professionalism. 
and co-taught with teachers at times in a variety of CTE programs. My primary area was what we called Building C. It was our manufacturing programs and really just uh, had a terrific experience there. The second part of my job was to go develop those business partnerships so that we could have students out. We did two week rotations for unpaid work experiences all the way to actual school to registered apprenticeships. And we had formalized programs at Delphi uh, and Saginaw Metal Casting at the time. So that was a while ago. Uh, and those opportunities to develop business partnerships, I spent time at the Chamber of Commerce events, at the Saginaw Valley Manufacturing Association events, and really just across Saginaw County because we had students from City of Saginaw schools, Arthur, High, Arthur Hill and Saginaw High, as well as all over the county, Chessening, Frankenmuth, St. Charles, and really worked hard to ensure that every single one of our students, we had 900 students, was able to have a work-based learning experience each year. It didn't do that alone, it was a team effort for sure. My principal there was a tremendous mentor to me as well. She actually saw things in me I didn't see in myself, which I know happens to us all along the way. She afforded me opportunities to travel, to workshops, to present on behalf of our school at a couple of state and national conferences and uh, allowed me to be the co-chair of our school improvement team. And I think that was my first real venture into understanding the power of continuous improvement. We used a Baldridge model there and received extensive training about that continuous improvement model. So I was ready in 2008 when Midland Public Schools posted a full-time CTE yeah. administrator position. Uh, as hard as it was to leave Saginaw, my principal really supported me in that application process and I came to Midland Public. And from there, uh, wow, lots of various opportunities and experiences. It was again 2008 and my primary responsibility was to be at Midland High and Dow High supporting our CTE programs. And the principals at those two buildings welcomed me in. I spent almost all of my time there, even though I did have an office here uh, at Central Administration. They welcomed me to be part of their leadership team, uh, part of their professional learning experiences, and I spent a lot of time in classes. It was that moment when I realized what an exceptional place this is, what high standards we have for students, and um, you know, just crystallized for me that this is absolutely where I belong. It was shortly after my arrival, you know, within a couple of years, where we fell on some hard financial times here in Midland, and we went through some uh, initial reorganization before the, the big reorganization of our curriculum team. Coincidentally, the county CTE coordinator was retiring, and our superintendents talked and agreed that I would serve half time here and be contracted out to be our countywide CTE coordinator. And uh, in hindsight, now that was a real blessing to have that opportunity as well because I got to know the other schools in our county formed really good relationships with those teachers and principals and superintendents and am proud to have been a small part of developing enhanced consortium programs for our CTE offerings, particularly the agri-science program out at Coleman, which kind of brought me back to my early years of teaching. I was then uh, able to come back here full time to Midland Public and that's when some of that shifting started. I found myself in a variety of coordinator roles I did CTE and K-12 science for a bit, then moved into the secondary curriculum position where it was math, science, English, and social studies, uh, and I was the secondary coordinator working across all four of our secondary schools with an amazing team of teacher leaders and uh, ensuring that our curriculum was staying tight, that we were advancing in our instructional practices and providing quality professional learning for our teachers. After that, uh, Mr. Shero invited me to serve as the Associate Superintendent of Curriculum Instruction and Assessment, where I spent five years before this interim role. And again, a great team of, of colleagues who taught me a lot about that level of administration and was able to see all aspects, all aspects uh, from our Monday morning, what we call agenda meetings, and really get a good sense of what it takes to lead an organization of our caliber and of our size and was of course thrilled when asked to serve as interim superintendent for these past eight months so thank you moving forward why 
Why are you most interested in this role and Midland Public in particular? That's like the easiest question of the night. <laughs> Thanks for asking. I, um, boy, without, without sounding too sentimental here, I will just tell you that I have such a sense of loyalty and care uh, for the people who work here at Midland Public Schools and for our students and families. I have been here for 16 years now. Uh, as I just shared with you, I've lived in the community for 20 years and it is a really special place. Our district is an exceptional place and our community at large is a fantastic place to live and work and, uh, and to raise a family. And my uh, husband, Craig, who also works here in the community, uh, he and I raised our daughter here. She is a graduate, Ava, of of Midland Public Schools and so I was able to experience as a parent as well just the exceptional opportunities available to her. She did complete her IB diploma which was a very uh, special opportunity for her. She was involved in music and athletics and community organizations as well. It is a remarkable place and just to put a little finer point on that we do great things here I also can keenly see where we have these edges, these growth edges that we just need to step into to take us to the next level. And I hold the highest aspirations for us, as I know you all do as board members, and I would be proud and excited to lead us forward into those areas. Thank you. All right, thanks, Penny. Uh, what strategies have you used or will you use to balance your time in the district versus visibility in the community? Yeah. Um, I actually have really prioritized based on um, you know, my focus areas at the start of this interim role. I've prioritized being very visible, and not just visible, but really present in the moment and engaged and approachable when I'm both at schools here in the district and when I'm out in the community. There are moments during the day where uh, it makes sense for me to be out of the district, engaged in a community activity or event, but where possible, you ask for strategies, I really try to prioritize my time when students are in school and when staff are in school, that I'm here in school. Uh, and again, being really visible and engaged, I am proud to say that our team has completed over 250 classroom visits this school year. And those range from popping in for 10 minutes where we might just, you know, even get on the rug with a student while they're reading a book or sit next to them at their table while they're, they might be working on a learning task uh, and then leaving, um, maybe giving the teacher a fist bump on the way out. And that also includes our more in-depth literacy walkthroughs where we're gathering observational data to help inform what our teachers need next. Those moments and then the follow-up communication with teachers have been so favorably received and we've we get um, lots of, of gracious notes about our connection so it isn't just being visible but it's actually connecting with people when you're out at those experiences we've also taken our monday morning meetings on the road uh, we rather than be here in room nine we are out every monday for our agenda meetings at a school and on rotation, a group of administrators come in and connect with us. Those are also moments, even just this morning where we were at Jefferson, you know, making sure that we're saying hello to teachers on the way in, uh, just connecting with kids and staff along the way. We're doing that for some of our other administrative uh, meetings as well, trying to be out in buildings. So again, being present, being very responsive, emails every day from staff, good, bad, and in between, and you know, not avoiding those, really stepping into those discussions, whether it's email, uh, going and meeting with them, or calling them on the phone. The community pieces uh, come, come pretty easy for me just because I have established relationships throughout town. And I was fortunate because of this role to have some of those kind of pre-ready for me as well. So serving on boards such as the United Way in Greater Midland gives me opportunities to really embed myself in the work happening across our community and engage with those leaders who are at those meetings. Similarly with our community success panel, uh, a group of leaders across town who are really committed 
to helping our uh, community thrive and continue to move forward. I served on the Shelter House Board for eight years and did some really um, important work, personally important work as well with that organization. And reaching out, you know, it's a two-way street, so certainly I have thought partners from across the community when we have a challenge or I need to talk something through, knowing that we can be connected and supportive. This community is, they love kids. I mean, you all know that. And uh, they think very highly of Midland Public Schools, and I think there is an appetite to continue growing our connection. All right, what is your communication style? How do you plan to communicate with stakeholders in the MPS community, and how will you achieve transparency without exhausting stakeholders with information? Communication is uh, one of the underpinnings of my focus area around community and uh, I think it's something that I'm I'm pretty good at uh, the folks who work most closely with me will roll their eyes when they hear me say this but I often remind them that I am a very kind person and for me kindness in communication means that we're very clear and we're very direct in a very caring way but it is important in all communication to me that we are we are clear and uh, there are no mixed messages as we navigate both pleasant and lovely conversations as well as uh, difficult and challenging uh, situations. So knowing that communication was an important focus area, we are in the final stages of a partnership with a local communication firm. We are very fortunate to have some corporate sponsorship uh, grant for that communications uh, refresh and we'll be launching some new communication modes and strategies across the district. It is uh, in the community profile, uh, the district profile obviously indicated that's a big area of need. I believe we've done better in communicating uh, with our families and stakeholders, particularly when we have an incident happen in our community and I feel good about the transparency we've had with that. It will be an ongoing learning moment for our stakeholders to know there's only so much information that can be shared in those moments, but we've received positive feedback about how we've advanced communication there. We, one of the pieces that we will be rolling out is a staff newsletter. I think that is a gap for us right now. The communique reaches thousands of people. It is a lovely way for us to share the awesomeness that happens across our district, but it is not something specific to staff. And I believe as you know, we're the third largest employer in our community, and while we always will make student-centered decisions, we also need to tend to the fact that we are an employer, and we need to communicate with and care about our team, and direct communication with them through a newsletter helps us reinforce the culture we want, the messaging we want, and is one way to unite us. I also think, as hard as this is for me, uh, video communication matters. Those quick little two minute videos where someone can see your face and hear your voice is also a way to build connection across our larger organization. Um, so I've wandered a bit from your question. Let me just come back and put a finer point on uh, John that clear, clarity, uh, predictable cadence, uh, predictable formats and structures is certainly where we're headed and that needs to happen with all of our stakeholder groups and it needs to be personalized enough that they know it's for them, for families, for students, for staff, and for the broader community. All right, this is a great one. Um, well, you all know my intensity right now around literacy, but I'd like to just maybe scope that out a bit more to say, you know, student success is what we're about, and academic growth and achievement and well-being is, is our most important, those are our most important outcomes. We know that the teacher is the most important factor in, in the day-to-day -day learning and growth of our students. So, Investments in that bucket of student success for me look like supporting teachers, ensuring that we are creating the conditions for them to be successful. The learning environment has the resources that are necessary. 
the facility has uh, meets the expectations for a prime learning environment. Teachers feel valued and supported through particular well-being strategies. We have curriculum uh, that is coherent and aligned. Those are all supports for teachers. We're creating the conditions for them to do their best work. And I'd rem be remiss if I didn't say that culture is a big part of that. I, I hope we have a chance to talk about that a little later. But any investment in teachers is, translates, in, uh, in my experience, to gains in academic growth, achievement, and well-being. Quality professional learning matters. We have great principals, a great curriculum team who work hard to provide good quality professional learning. I do think it's an area uh, where we, we stand to have some growth in, in investment in professional learning, even bringing in some uh, key facilitators to help us with some of those areas that we know we need a little bit more learning, a little bit more depth, and some growth. Thank you, Brett. The next question <laughs> Great. has to do with um, working to achieve student proficiency and growth um, and what your strategies are regardless of student background. So you'd like to know specific strategies that we would use to support student learning and growth? Regardless of background. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I just said teachers are it, right? So that is an important strategy. I, I won't say too much more about that, but certainly supporting teachers matters. A coherent, uh, you know, the, the lingo is guaranteed and viable curriculum, but a coherent, guaranteed, viable curriculum using um, high-powered, high-leverage instructional practices consistently in every classroom, every single day, so that we have this guaranteed experience uh, for all students, tier one. And when I say consistent, coherent, guaranteed, I want to be clear that that doesn't mean every teacher is reading from a manual, right? There are common expectations, high expectations that we're going to hold for all of our students. A course, an algebra course at any one of our schools is going to have a similar learning experience for students. Uh, and those will be exceptionally high expectations with exceptionally high support. So having that foundation of curriculum, having this foundation of key high leverage instructional practices that our teachers have had the opportunity to practice and receive feedback and really build that skill in using that practice matters. From there, uh, it is utilizing our tiered system of support. And uh, you've heard before that we are working hard to enhance our multi-tiered system of support. Again, what I just described is tier one. And those experience need to have multiple access points for all of our students. It can't just be this one single way, this one single learning task. It needs to be accessible to all students. If a student then needs additional support, we're looking at classroom level data to identify exactly what it is they need and we are providing an additional intervention or support to meet that need. And we're running that intensity and frequency of that intervention as appropriate for the student. And once they're ready, they're moving on again with, with the cohort. Uh, and again, if there's another student that has this gap in a concept, a skill, a, a piece of knowledge, we're offering an intervention. So it's this ongoing cycle of using classroom level data, uh, observational data, student work. Uh, we, we know we have NWEA that is a powerful tool for sure, but day in and day out, teachers have lots of ways to know what students need. I think we also need to build some coherence on a broader level um, among the offerings we have. We have some AP courses, we have fabulous IB programmatic experience as well as individual courses that students can access. We have dual enrollment, we are emerging in the early middle college. Uh, we have a lot of things, going. we have CTE, we have Project Lead the Way, we have a lot of amazing things happening and I, one challenge that we have, an opportunity in front of us, is to really map out in a more coherent way what these experiences look like and making sure that as any student is ramping up to head into high school to access one of these programs or experiences that we know that we have filled all of the potential gaps for them. And ultimately, 
My hope for students, of course, is to reach proficiency in all of the areas. Uh, exceed proficiency in all the areas to be more correct because I want them to have options when they leave us. I want them to know that choosing the military, choosing a trade school, directly entering the workforce, going to a community college or a university, they are all within their reach and they can choose what is the best fit for them. I could probably talk about that all night. I'll stop there because I know somebody's keeping time here. <laughs> what approach would you take to address and remedy achievement gaps between schools within the district? Similar to what I just said. So uh, at the risk of, of repeating myself, um, I'll just offer that tiered system of support is a gateway for us to to really meet the needs of individual students. And I think it starts with what I just offered, that we need to have this more, co we, we need to have greater coherence across our system. We need to look at the learning continuum from preschool all the way to grade 12 or past grade 12. And we need to deeply understand where those connection points are from grade to grade. And we need to build that consistency in both of our pathways. We have obviously have feeder patterns that ultimately lead to Dow High and Midland High, and we need to ensure that all along the way that we're maintaining our, our expectations for students, that we are aligned to our standards, uh, that we're supporting teachers and understanding what that looks like and means, and means uh, in the classroom. And one way that we can do that is by bringing teachers together more frequently to collaborate to engage with one another, to make meaning of these standards, and to even co-create units of study, uh, you know, units of inquiry or study, whatever the, the phrase is that we wanna use once we determine that, and build them together. And that is one way to ensure that we are starting to build this coherence uh, throughout our system. I don't believe that our teachers on one side of town are expecting less from, from the teachers on another side of town. I think it's just the creep that happens when you don't carefully attend to that cohesion. And uh, for lots of reasons, we have not, in our recent couple of years for professional learning, we've not brought our teachers together across town by departments. We just started doing that a bit again this year, and I think we're on the right track for developing some of that um, that consistency that we need. Uh, the next question, Penny. Um, how will you bring community organizations and governmental agencies together with the district to create a healthy, healthier working and collaborative partnership for the good of the district and the community? Yeah, I love this question. I, um, again, here is my clearest kind, right? Uh, <laughs> I was a bit surprised to hear in some of the feedback we received through the, um, the superintendent search profile that there is some thinking that we might not be great partners with some of our community agencies because it's certainly not how I feel about our community and the offerings that we have. We, ha again, live in, I, I can't even sometimes wrap my head around what an amazing community we have with so many agencies so many nonprofits who want to work with us and support us and our students. Now, I will say, I am fiercely protective of instructional time. And I am very proud of what our teachers are doing in classrooms. So it is important to me that we scrutinize opportunities that come to us where they're asking to push into the school day and be part of that instructional time. And I believe there are many opportunities where those map together and we can make that happen. But I just wanna be clear with you that it's important to me that we um, protect that time. Now, having said that, there are lots of ways that we can still make good things happen for students together. It is not meant to be an exclusionary statement that I just made. It's actually meant to be inclusionary in the way that it can fit somewhere, right? We can. Uh, help funnel students to particular organizations across town where they can meet student and family needs. Uh, 
and I know we have partnerships. I know Junior Achievement, I used to serve on that board, um, offers some really great financial literacy lessons that we've used. I know that we have partnered with the Legacy Center, for example, for our multi-language learners and really finding some great opportunities to leverage their work with adults and our work with students and hosting some events together. So I know there's a way, um, and I'm very excited uh, to, to go down that path. Our administrative team, uh, along with myself, we are very well connected on these boards and agencies, and uh, we'll continue to, to partner where we can. I'll just leave it there, John, because, you know, lots of opportunities, and I look forward to that. Great. Um, next question. <laughs> How have you, <clears throat> excuse me, how have you held your leadership team or staff accountable for their roles and responsibilities? Please provide specific examples. Role clarity is really important to me out of the gate, ensuring that everyone knows what's expected of them, what their areas of responsibility are, and the expectations that we will mutually hold for one another. Uh, I'm, I'm going to if you'll forgive me for this one, you know, any story I have to offer, because I've been here for so long, um, I really respect the people that work here and might not work here uh, or used to work here, and I want to be careful that I'm maintaining confidentiality and dignity and respect for those people. So if I could give you maybe a hypothetical that will sort of lean into um, a window into how I think about working uh, and setting expectations and and if that doesn't happen, how we remedy that. So again, role clarity is absolutely important, making sure that everyone knows exactly uh, what's expected. Providing tremendous support to my team is really important uh, across all of the areas that, uh, where I've led, knowing that they feel cared for, we're creating a culture of care, of trust, of mutual respect. Uh, is absolutely important, and I'm not gonna lie, we like to have a little fun too, because I think that matters at work. However, uh, when we see someone straying from those expectations, uh, we'll talk about an individual first, and then we'll come back to the group. Again, clear is kind. I, it is important to me because I care about each team member, that I'm very honest with them, that I share uh, what's not going well, and Honestly, I should say before that interaction, I pause and reflect. Because if a member of, of a team that I'm leading is not meeting expectations, I first have to make sure that I've done my job. Do they know what they're supposed to do? Have I been clear? Do they have support? If not, then we go down this path of building clarity, um, putting a plan in place where there is maximum support with timelines and check-ins, and you know, my ultimate goal is that that trajectory changes and that they remain on our team as a productive, valued member. And if not, unfortunately, then there are ways that we can help them find a place outside of Midland Public that might be a good fit for them. I often say it's, they're not bad people, it's just a bad fit for a particular role. And that's my responsibility. Our work is incredibly hard. Our job is to support teachers to be their best, to support our administrators to be their best, and uh, you know um, from the state level data that our admin team is incredibly lean in comparison to many other districts from across the state. So uh, if I'm thinking about the team I lead of administrators, we, we all need to be doing our best. Now when a team gets a little off kilter, uh, that's on me too, kind of the same process. I pause and reflect, did we have clarity? Did they know the expectations? Was there support? And if not, that's on me. And I have to work harder to make sure that happens. And I will be quite honest with you, we have done some tremendous work as an admin council around that very topic. We were feeling a bit astray among our admin group, and I care a great deal about all 40-ish of those people. There, there's like 40, I think, when we're all together, including our department leaders. And when I recognized that happening, uh, I first recognized we needed some communication training. So two summers ago, uh, with Mike's, Mike Shero's permission, we planned for every administrator to complete the Our Community Listens training. So we could build our skills in reflective communication, 
and having direct communication. And at the end of that workshop, it's a three or four day workshop, you really lean into hard conversations uh, and, and having what they call productive discourse or conflict. We practice those skills, continue to use those skills, continue to hold each other accountable to those skills. And then last summer, we engaged with a consultant, his name is Steve Seward, uh, and he came and spent two days with us to help us, again, through the transition period from uh, Mr. Shero to myself, really align our thinking as a team, make sure that we had common working agreements of how we wanted to lead together as an admin council, how we would show up for one another. And I'm really proud of that work. I have felt and have received lots of feedback from our team members that we are a more cohesive team, that we do have clarity about what our expectations are and we're moving in the right direction. So I hope that was an example both for individuals and collectively. I, and I hope you see that I um, first come from a place of care for the people with whom I work and lead, uh, but have no issues holding people accountable with lots of support as well. All right. So aging infrastructure is a concern, as you're aware. Uh, older and outdated buildings across the district need attention and renovations. As superintendent, what is the best way to approach this topic with the community? How do you determine what the needs are and what the community will support in regards to passing a bond? That's a great question and very timely. I am really excited about our future when we think about facilities. We have exceptional programming and I want our facilities to match the aspirations we have for our students and staff. So this process through the facility assessment has been just a really good opportunity for me to learn and grow in this area and to understand the power of our community and the importance of their voice. So um, certainly we are at a juncture right now where their, their opinion matters and we need to get some input. We'll have a very robust plan, including surveys, focus groups. My door will always be open. I think I've already started to answer some emails from community members who watched the December board presentation and have comments and questions. It's just gonna take that level of connection with the community. I believe having been here now for 16 years and having relationships both internally and externally that I'm well suited to help lead us through that. I believe I have established good trusting relationships and will continue to focus on that moving forward. And I believe that's what it's going to take when we are out talking with our, our community members, our voters, our stakeholders, the people that we care most about, they need to know that we're actually listening, that we aren't just asking to check a box, that we truly need their input to refine what will ultimately end up on a ballot proposal. And uh, it's pretty high stakes, right? We have seen across our state, other districts go to their voters and not be successful. And we will be successful because we will invest the time, energy, and effort to get that community feedback and input from the start. So it's gonna take a lot of time. It's gonna take a ton of communication, multiple modes, a lot of face-to-face -face interactions, and a lot of meaningful, uh, reflective listening. Penny, what is the level of involvement and participation of certain employees in organizational decisions, and how do you determine what groups to include and when? It's a great question. So. Just to think about decision making overall, and maybe to give you a quick window into my approach to that, you know, there are some decisions that clearly I need to make as superintendent, and I get the input and data I need, and I make it, and we move on. Uh, then there's another bucket for me that is input, and I think that's where I like to spend most of my time in making decisions. I like to hear from the people who are most closely impacted by the work or those who are doing the work. So in, in this case, that's our staff, right? It's our staff, it's our students, uh, it's our team members. And right now we don't have uh, enough formal structures to get input when we're making decisions. So it becomes um, 
really labor intensive and maybe even a little cumbersome because we're the size we are with so many different campuses, we need to develop some more consistent structures and protocols for, for gathering input before we make decisions. And I look forward to that. I look forward to getting out into schools for some listening sessions or conversations. I think we can do a better job of, um, I just read an article that really intrigued me. They called them think tanks. I don't know if I love that word, but there's a district uh, in another state that whenever there is a problem of practice, they convene a group of stakeholders and they make sure that it's representative from across the district. So we have a problem of practice around, I'm making this up, attendance. Oh, awesome. Let's really analyze the problem and let's grab some teachers who really know students and understand what's happening. Let's grab some parents. Let's get some students on the team. Let's get some of our community partners and agencies who really work closely with youth and no kids like we do. And let's really dig into this. Let's look at the data. Let's get some perception data as well as just attendance data. Let's look at the research and evidence-based practice around, prob um, around positive attendance. And let's generate some ideas that we can uh, bring to the table as solutions. So that was a really long way of saying we need to do a better job of this and I'm excited for this to happen. I, I do think input decisions are best and I don't always love the word buy-in because it feels just a, a little transactional. I really want participation. I want people who are fully engaged and want to participate uh, in these sessions and in these opportunities. Same thing with parents. Thank you. Well, Anne, that's a great question. Um, if you'll allow me, I'd like to go back to like 2008 when I came to the district. I know that's, that's kind of going back a ways, but um, I think this is a great example of where I really mucked it up and then had to make it right. So I was feeling good about being hired here at Midland Public Schools. It's an awesome place. And I had done some work in, at the Career Center in Saginaw. We were using uh, a particular model for school improvement, Baldridge, but then we were also using, it was called high schools that work out of, at the time, and there was a CTE component to that. And it included some really great practices around instructional strategies that were high leverage that needed to be in every classroom every day. And then there were particular ways that we could organize our curriculum. And so I thought I was a big deal and I showed up to our first professional learning session with our CTE teachers and told them, I told them uh, that this is what we were going to do. I had been here like a minute, to be honest. <laughs> I mean, I knew them, I'd spent some time in their classes, but this was like semester two of year one. And um, I won't say they were all kind, but they were very clear with me that uh, that's not how we worked here. You don't just show up and tell us what to do, like get to know us, get to understand our programs. Every CTE program here is incredibly unique in all of these beautiful ways. And this one approach that you thought worked might not work for us so please help us be let us be part of the conversation and planning and uh it was an amazing learning experience for me i will tell you it was the last time i showed up anywhere and told people what to do without a doing my homework and uh, b making sure that we had a lot of planning and conversation and that we co-created our next steps uh, it was a tough lesson and thankfully uh, I was able to recover those relationships and end up, ended up being very productive work with CTE teachers. Uh, many of them have, have retired now, if, uh, but I'm sure they would get a good laugh out of that story too. And I have question number 13, um, the final one that we have um, uh, set for the official interview. And it um, is in regards to um, relationship between superintendent and the board. Um, and how do you view that relationship and how will you keep um, board members informed and communicate with us? It's a great question. I think as a team, the superintendent and board are 
really the guiding light for the district. Uh, we are the team that really casts the expectations to meet the vision of the district, and we, we should exemplify the culture that we desire for our entire organization and for our school community. So I've used this term a couple of times, but I'll start with role clarity. I think being very clear about our roles and responsibilities is important, particularly in this relationship between a board and a superintendent. Uh, knowing that collectively uh, you do lead our district as the Board of Education, but it's my job as superintendent to ensure that uh, the day-to-day -day operations that teaching high quality teaching and learning are happening and that our entire team is cared for and there are certain points of collaboration along the way for us but knowing that's my responsibility at your leadership so role clarity is essential I think those um, those moments are where relationships are really cast and either set up for success or set up for for struggle also having clarity about modes of communication is really important for a superintendent and board. And when I accepted this opportunity to be interim, I met with each individual board member to talk about that. How is it best to communicate with you? Uh, how can I stay in touch with you? What is your particular style of communication that works best for you? And uh, collectively, there was agreement that the Friday letter as a communication tool makes great sense. And I do believe that is a powerful tool, not only for me to share with you what has happened across the district in that week, but to also be looking out at the, the horizon to see what's coming and ensure that we're staying in touch on what's next. I love the mutual agreement of no surprises. I think that is powerful for us to maintain good standing and positive relationships. And you know, there, I'm not gonna lie, there are some Fridays where I'm like, oh, that's a long, long Friday letter. Uh, hope, sure hope they read it, but I would rather be accused of over communicating than under communicating and ensuring that there are no surprises for you when you are out interacting with community members, parents, families, students, uh, and, and again, community leaders. Uh, I would also say I really value the relationships where we're checking in on one another. And I very much appreciated as interim, I think you are all keenly aware of you know, the unique nature of an interim superintendent. And I believe over the eight months, we've established some really great relationships that not too much time passes where if I haven't checked in with one of you, that you're checking in with me. And I just think that's incredibly important to stay in connection, even when it's hard. Uh, there are times where we will not agree individually or even potentially collectively. And that's when those good communication expectations and skills come in play. It's where clarity about who we are and who we want to be and how we're gonna function together matter most. And I'm, um, as you know, always happy to lean into those tough dis discussions so that we can keep working through it until we get to the other side. Well, thank you, Penny. Um, what questions do you have for us? Yeah, um, so the focus areas that were established through uh, my initial communication with you all and have been you know, my priorities over these past eight months were community, which focused on connecting with our, our community and improving communication. Uh, student success was one, particularly focused on teaching and learning and continuing to, to enhance our multi-tiered system of support as both a tool for equity and access, as well as uh, supporting struggling learners and accelerating learners as well. We didn't really talk about that tonight, but that's an important part of that curriculum conversation too. And then that third area was leadership, particularly around organizational capacity and finances and facilities. And I just wanna check in with you to see if, if your focus areas, uh, if you see that landscape changing at all, or if you still agree that those are three big areas of priority for us particularly moving in uh, to this next phase with a permanent superintendent. Does anybody else want to start? I would say that 
those are still consistent with the vast majority of what we've uh, discussed as a board and in particular as we make this um, transition to paying for some of the extra programs that we've put in place mm -hmm. to support students at, as part of COVID learning recovery as, as ESSER funds dry up and focusing on how we align our general budget to focus on those programs that have worked and in particular reflecting on the data uh, presentation that we had last week continuing our focus on early childhood literacy and really doubling down on that foundation so that we maintain our progressive growth um, as we move students through the, the entire K, PK to 12 system um, continuing to do that but to your point on community we can't do anything without our voters yeah and you know establishing relationships first and foremost before we even ask them for help in mm -hmm. setting the direction of the district especially from a facility standpoint is imperative so yeah. I would say yes we are still aligned Agreed. okay do you have other questions for well, us? Well, you know, it, it's a little awkward to ask y'all questions because I'm, <laughs> I'm here with you every day. So uh, I think I'm good. If, if you'll indulge me, just as I quickly reflect on my responses to the questions, I, um, I feel like I gave a commercial for Midland Public Schools maybe more than I did for myself, and that, that feels a little awkward. There was a lot of we in those responses, and it's important for me um, to clarify with you that anything that we do here is a team effort and I know deeply my response ultimate responsibility as superintendent uh, for the success of our district and I don't take that lightly um, my use of we more than the use of me and I I think represents just my philosophy of leadership and how I want to work with people you know we have an incredible team here and uh, it's it's absolutely a team effort so um, I'll try to sell myself a little better with these next re batch of questions. All right, what other questions do you have? Scott? Um, just kind of a, a non-scripted question here, Penny. Y you said you created, a, you touched on a little bit, the superintendent student advisory team. Yeah. Can you tell us the story behind yeah. that and, and maybe give us an update as to how it's doing? I'm so glad you asked. That is um, one of my favorite experiences so far. I am a big believer in amplifying student voice. You know, you'll hear people sometimes say, oh, we need, we need more student voice. Students have lots of voice. We just need to listen, uh, and we need to provide opportunities for them to show up and share. And so it really came from that place. I read a book that really profoundly changed me. Uh, it's called Street Data. And the nature of the book is really that you need to go to people and, and ask. You can't wait for people to show up and tell you. And, and sometimes the people who show up and tell you, they, they matter for sure, but, um, but so do the ones who aren't yet ready or willing to come say what they need to say. And so I was really intentional in selecting students from both Midland High, Dow High, and it was important that we had representatives from our PATHS program as well. And it's a group of 18 students, very diverse group. I wanted students who themselves were willing to say, you know what, I'm not in the top academic ranks. I'm struggling to show up to school. I'm struggling to find connection at school. And I also want the students who are academically successful. So this is a group of 18 amazing students that represent the best of everything about us. And we've had one meeting so far because unfortunately it was a snow day on our first scheduled meeting. We've had one meeting and we're very fortunate to partner with the Wellbeing Coalition. Kathy Snyder is facilitating this as an expert facilitator. We've identified all the, the same things we do with our leaders, how we want to work together, how we want to treat one another in this work. And then we have, uh, at their urging, prioritized topics that we're going to dig into. And we're looking at it both through an asset-based perspective. So what is going really well here that we need to leverage across the district? And I believe we're going to elicit a lot of good ideas from that just by bringing uh, mm -hmm. these students together. And then we really want to lean into, uh, as hard as it might be to hear, what's not going well? What are you not loving about your experience here at Midland Public Schools? And what can we do better together? 
and using the assets and strengths we have to really edge into those opportunities. I'm incredibly excited about where this is going to take us and I've committed to these students uh, to see this through certainly this year and uh, hopefully beyond this year. Speaking of snow day, I thought that might have been your Oh, please answer don't to ask the, about uh, that, Phil. <laughs> <laughs> to the hardest decision you have to make. <laughs> um, Brad, I saw you reach for your button. Did you have a, a question? Well, John, do you want to ask your question first about our, or go right into Mr. Bruton's? Okay. Nope, you go ahead. <clears throat> so we did have a uh, presentation in December. Brian stood up along with yourself yeah. and talked about some opportunities, our facility studies and where we could be headed. We, we, we gave two different options. Whether those are the actual options we go with, we don't know because we have to get to the people. Um, what is your comfort level with a big price tag, a big go to the people of something like a $300 million bond? What is Penny Miller, Miller yeah. Nelson's comfort level with that? Well, you know, I'm always really inspired by people who are bold and can see the greatest aspirations for us. I, I love to be with people like that. I find myself sort of like-minded in that way. So I'm, I'm not afraid to go down that road, but I will tell you my excitement, enthusiasm will match the community input we get. It is not my place exclusively as superintendent of Midland Public Schools to solely uh, dictate what that proposal will be. And I don't live the same experiences as everyone in our community. And it's important for us to hear what they desire for us to be, um, what they feel they can afford. We have a diverse population across our community. I know that every dollar matters uh, to all families it's a little more acute for some of, of our families in our, in our district. So um, I'm really not skirting your answer. My answer is that my enthusiasm will match that of the community. Okay. I think that's great. And, and we, are not, uh, we are not going to tell the public either what, <laughs> where Fair we're enough. headed. They will do that for Fair us. Enough. Yes. Yeah. Thanks for asking. I actually think this is one of my strengths and um, I hope feedback that you receive uh, will align with, with my insights about this being a strength. I believe that the culture of our organization is what drives our success. Having a culture of care for people. We are an organization of people for people, right? 80 5% of our uh, annual budget is in people. And that's just the dollar investment, right? I want us to invest in our level of care and support of people. So uh, refreshing our culture, I certainly don't want to portray that we um, have a poor culture. We have worked hard in recent years to make sure that we stay connected and aligned but it's very clear based on feedback that we need to take that to the next level. So uh, I believe, although it is the most joyful part of my experience being out in classrooms, I also think it is a tool, a strategy to help enhance our culture. When Brian and Jeff and I and Jen and Melissa are out in buildings, people notice. They notice that we're there because we care about what's happening in classrooms. It is not lost on them when we are in it with them, right? Um, we were in a classroom recently where a student was, um, you know, using some manipulatives and sitting down with them and working with them. Like it shows a level of care about students. Teachers see that and it shows a level of care um, for our teachers. So I believe one of my greatest responsibilities, yes, facilities matter immensely. Finances matter immensely. That's how we get things done. But if our culture is not healthy, if it's not trusting, if it's not collaborative, you know, our vision statement says it, inclusive, collaborative, equitable culture. And that is my, my first responsibility is to people. So all of the strategies that we can put in place around building connection and community, 
I believe that communication is one of, again, one of our best tools to enhance our culture. It's why I look forward to the staff newsletter. And again, as painful as it is, some of these short video messages where they can hear me and see me and I can express my level of care uh, for our team members is really important to me. And I'm proud to say that I do feel a shifting. I feel a shifting just a little bit more in that direction of collaboration um, and in that sense of care. I've probably used the word care now 100 times. I'll stop. Thanks for asking, Ann. Any other board members have maybe one final question? Did you want to ask about snow days? Because we had a really fun opportunity <laughs> this week when uh, last week we were visiting a classroom and um, one of the teachers put me right on the spot to explain to this group of students <laughs> my decision-making process for snow days. It was actually amazing. I'll always talk with kids. I'd rather not do that here. But. <laughs> <laughs> I won't ask about snow thanks, days. Thanks, thanks. Yeah. Uh, any, anything else for... Any uh, final comments you want to share with, with the board or the community in particular? I am just, um, you know, I started by saying I have such a sense of loyalty uh, to the people who work here and to our community, and I hope you feel that's genuine. I know I focused a lot on those aspects of care and culture. Uh, I don't want you to mistake that for a lack of knowledge and skill in what it means to lead this organization. I shared a few examples of my um, knowledge and skill and experience, particularly in curricul curriculum instruction and assessment, I think that transcends to other areas as well. We have some important work to do ahead of us. I know that you know that. Um, and I feel really ready to advance us in that work. My primary reason for being here is students. And I know that we are doing exceptional things for them. I also see where we can do even better for each of our students and really ensure they're reaching their fullest potential. So I hope I get another opportunity to talk with you and share some more specific details about those processes that we use. I heard you mention program evaluation. I feel really good about my skill set in that area along with implementation science as we think about really important intentional ways that we implement programming, monitor, measure, evaluate. And when it comes to making a hard decision about potentially de-implementing something because it's not giving us outcomes, I feel very ready to do that to free up our capacity to do other things that might be um, better suited for us. Thank you. Thank this you. has been fun. Thank you, Thank you very much for joining us. And um, I, I know interviewing is tough and especially publicly interviewing. So I appreciate yeah. your candidness with us in the community. And I'll just remind the, the community and those in the room to please provide feedback on all of our candidates. But thank you, Penny. Awesome. Thank you. I'll stick around for my Do you need any more time to get settled? Okay. Oh, no, I'm good. All right. The trip was enough. Yeah. <laughs> Do you all have updated copies of my information? Yes. All right, good. Thank you. Well, Dr. Reed, thank you for uh, joining us tonight. I appreciate the you applying for the position as mm -hmm. well as taking the time to come interview with us. It means a lot. Um, tonight, I'll ask um, the first two questions, and then each of my fellow board members will ask a series of questions. In front of you, we've provided a copy of the questions just so um, you can read along with us um, and reference back to them as you uh, develop your answers. Um, we're going to try and target 45 minutes to 50 minutes of, mm -hmm. of Q&A back and forth with the 13 questions and then leave time at the end for you to ask us questions and for the board to follow up with any additional follow-up. Um, so with that, we'll, we'll start and allow, your, allow you to introduce yourself, um, share any information about your background, strengths, and current and past work experience pertinent to, to this role. 
All righty. First of all, thank you all for having me. Uh, saw some interesting roles coming here. Uh, saw Eight Mile, so I was really excited. I thought I was uh, where Eminem was talking about, but I realized that was not it. Uh, so I was really excited at the trip. I passed the casino. I was planning on coming early so I can uh, sightsee, so it was really exciting to get here. Uh, my name is Dr. Antoine Reed. Uh, I'm really privileged to be here. I uh, started playing football. It's one of my first places I played. I played uh, up in Michigan. I got to see Charles Woodson. Uh, so I've always liked Michigan. Uh, he's probably my favorite player, uh, really interesting guy. So I've met him personally before I got to college. So I, I uh, enjoy being here first. Uh, my background, i uh, from Chicago. I became a football coach, came back after I got in NFL, got hurt, dinged up. I didn't make it through. I was a little guy. Tyreek Hill didn't exist yet, so it was just me. And uh, most of the receivers were really big at the time. So I got hurt, came back home, started coaching, and I'm in the inner city of Chicago, back at the same school I graduated from. Had an opportunity to see a lot of scholars did not have the opportunity to even understand that college was an opportunity. So I began to teach math. Uh, that was my first topic. I taught math. And I remember being taught math in a way that was unique to me. Uh, I was a unique scholar, so I understood that, you know, you had to engage me. I was not just going to sit there and get lectured to. So I remember teaching math and growing my scholars on the ACT, and it became a thing for me because I knew how to move, you know, students at that pace that was required and above the state. And these are scholars that you usually traditionally would not see, you know, engage in math. Uh, we had auto shop and everything was CTE-like, so we really tapped into that at Harper High School. We had some tough things going at Harper. Uh, it was where I first became an assistant principal around 2014. We had a show called This American Life because it, it was a unique place. Uh, Michelle Obama flew out. I got to meet her. She's one of the people I, she's probably just as strong as Charles Woodson because she's something else. Uh, and so I met her personally, and we just talked about, you know, the journey of, of Chicago. She went to Whitney Young. I went to Harper. So, you know, as an assistant principal there, that's why I got my groundwork. Uh, that's why I began to understand differentiating the instruction. And I began to understand behavior management uh, is, is, is a, it's a, it's a complex thing. When you have tight curriculum that the, the scholars can show their culture, you don't usually have those behavior management issues. So I became, you know, you know, usually you get an African-American male come into place, turn around, it's discipline oriented. And I, I pushed against that. You know, it was not about discipline for me. It was about does the scholar see him or her in the curriculum? Because if I can come and show up and show out what I know, I want to be in class. And I, I understood that different scholars learn different ways. And so in my journey, I became an assistant principal for about five to seven years quickly became a principal, worked as a dean. Uh, teaching was my passion, coaching, and so I'm doing all these coaching and teaching, and it was just fun. Um, I got a chance to teach my own siblings. I moved on to a charter school. Uh, you know, they had Anthony Davis. It was his school, so he wanted someone that was into sports. Uh, so I, I was uh, the principal of his charter school at Perspectives. Uh, you know, during that time, that was right before the pandemic, we had the top graduation rate in Chicago at that time. Same thing, uh, same things apply through our equity lens. You know, I got an opportunity to work with uh, multiple stakeholders, NBA players. I got a chance to meet LeBron James. And you just listening to these guys talk about education from their lens was really important to me. I'm an athlete. Uh, you know, I do things in a coaching philosophy. I believe in building people up and meeting them where they have to go. So when I left the charter schools, uh, South Bend, uh, they had opportunity, they needed some help turning around a, a group of schools. And so it was interesting to me because I, I got an opportunity at South Bend to not only work at the principal level, but work with a quadrant of schools. Uh, I was in charge of the equity imperatives, uh, the curriculum alignment. I got a chance to partner with Notre Dame. I'm not a fan of Notre Dame, I'm just on that right up front. <laughs> I love touchdown Jesus, but uh, Notre Dame is a little interesting. But I, I, I enjoyed working with Notre Dame <laughs> because of the, the things they wanted to do for scholars. And that meant a lot to me because, you know, those scholars in South Bend, they didn't, they didn't have those opportunities. They, they were, you know, going through things that many people were ignoring them. And we had about six schools, and my challenge was to move those schools. So I told them, I said, look, once I move the schools, you know, I'm going to, you know, go on. I want to be a high school principal. But I had a bunch of elementary schools. So it was, it was not, you know, something I was, that wasn't my cup of tea at first. But I realized, you know, I knew I was going to be a superintendent one day. I think I, I wanted to cross every box leading into this position that I'm going to be in. And so working elementary 
it, it kind of changed my perspective. Because I realized as a high school principal, you have a complete product. And if you're going to move that scholar, you've got to move them in pre-K. You've got to move them when they walk in the door. So I remember at South Bend taking every scholar in all six schools to Notre Dame. And I remember telling that scholar right off the bat, this is where we're going. And really believing in the, in, in the onus that a scholar can learn no matter where they're coming from. And uh, that, that was my goal. We did an awesome job. Uh, we kind of doubled the numbers we were supposed to have, cut all the suspension rates. And I, once again, it was not the, the, the traditional way, looking at behavior management. We looked at student leadership. We looked at attendance as engagement. I didn't care if a scholar showed up. I cared if he, he or she showed out. Meaning, can you get up and articulate where you stand in this curriculum and how you're in part of it? So everywhere I go, you're going to kind of see a theme of putting the scholar at the forefront, putting the community there, and then really supporting our teachers. I realized at South Bend, we wanted a lot of things to happen as far as equity, as far as getting those teachers the tools they needed. But you don't create the space. So as, 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 as I'm working these six schools, I got an opportunity to make sure that we onboard it the correct way to the school year. Uh, if you don't onboard the school year correctly, you're going to repeat some of the processes that you do not want to see. So instead of just jumping out into the curriculum because everybody's behind, every time you start a school year, you, you, you innate think you're behind. But building those relationships shoots you out farther than you can ever go. So that year our goal was to cut suspensions and you know, behavior management down 20%. We cut that 40%, but that was not the focus. It was growing our, our scores. And you, we, we jumped 30% on our, our scores, but just using simple metrics of using intervention embedded in the culture of the classroom and getting the scholars to read things that they identify with and being really key into cultural relevant instruction. Uh, also applying everything the scholar learned to something they can actually touch and feel. That came in handy because uh, as COVID was hitting, you guys recognize after COVID, school has totally looked a little different for the scholars. They, uh, when I got out, even uh, South Bend, I get another call. I, I, I wanted to be a superintendent in Wisconsin. I had new uh, Mr. Posey, he's the superintendent there. So he was always recruiting me to be up under him. So Wisconsin calls, they have an opportunity. He says, yeah, man, you can come on out here. I'm, I've been waiting on you to come to Wisconsin. So I come out there to a school called uh, West Alice West. And so this is a bigger high school. And you know, I didn't want to come just to be a principal. So the, the, the role for me there was a dual role as well. I did the equity imperative for the entire district. I did the curriculum, uh, building it out with the, with the team. And we had two different schools in West Alice. We had a school that was predominantly uh, not diverse, uh, probably to the tune of 96%, and a school that was more diverse. We were split, uh, Central, so I chose to go to Central. Uh, and there were some things that I had to challenge there. I didn't come in uh, and just you know, take what was given. I had to look at things from a different lens. I realized it was a reason why all one group of scholars went to one school and another went to another. And I had to have the conversation with my superintendent. And, and during that conversation, we began to realize that, hey, there's some things that we authentically have to change if we want to believe in each and every scholar. So when we say equity imperative for us at those schools, we really landed to, we got heavy into CTE. Career technical education was a forefront of what we did. We had a lot of things with automotives. We had a lot of things with our arts and theater. And that is where we landed heavy. And getting those scholars engaged in that school was really fun, because now it's at the high school level. High school was a little tougher because, you know, you don't turn that kid a lot in high school. But being a champion for the scholars at, at Central was really fun for me. I got the opportunity to, uh, you know, work with the district and we build a, a, an imperative that is going on now where we look at their bags and we're making sure that every teacher is trained on that. And once again, the onboarding at Central was something that I came in uh, with a focus on how we start the school year. I, I, I call it don't get on the block list. Our parents always were here at Central about how every time a scholar did something wrong, right off the year. So I say, hey, there's a reason why they don't talk to you all. By week two and three, you're already felling scholars, and you're blocked. So we, we onboarded totally different. The first three weeks were only positive grading. And it was reaching out to our families just to say, hey, look, thank you for allowing your scholars to be in our place. And that opened doors that we did not have before, because the parents began to be involved. And um, once you get the parents and community, you've got everything else. Our schools become, became open. Uh, and we begin to do things that we always wanted to do at Central. So leaving Central was really tough, but I, I was authentic everywhere I've been. I knew I was going to, I was working towards the goal. I knew I was going to be a superintendent. So Rockford calls, the two superintendents kind of knew each other, you know, and hey, you know, he said, hey, Dr. Reed, look, you can come out here and you could be the school's team lead and you can manage all the principals, uh, but you've kind of done that. 
Or you can take on the deputy chief role and you could, you know, do the equity role. I will flush everything through your department. So I liked it, that opportunity because if I was just manage principals, it was something I had got an opportunity to do and, and, and work on before. But in the role I'm currently in at Rockford, I'm really uh, proud of that role uh, because we've done things in Illinois that everybody in the Midwest is coming to see. We've partnered with multiple colleges. Um, we built new pathways. We have grow our own initiatives. We're not waiting on the next teacher. We're building it from our freshman academy. So we're making teachers out of people that probably would not become teachers. Many people have not had that conversation. We make teaching look so bad. We don't market it right. So we make teaching look fun. We hype it up. And uh, we have all the colleges in the area partnering with us. We even went out to Iowa. And so Iowa is not, uh, you know, usually a place that comes to Illinois, but they're in our, our partnership. I began to be a, a professor at uh, Central State because we wanted a population that represented our scholars as well. And so I'm an adjunct teacher there. So I still every kid that's in the uh, education program because they have to come through my class. So we built a robust, a robust system of, of, of attracting and retaining. And I want to just touch on retaining in my current role, Deputy Chief of Equity, everything has to come to that, through that department. How we spend, how we do curriculum, do we do it in an umbrella or did we include the scholars and everybody? So one of the things I would say I was most proud of is making sure that everybody had a voice. But we didn't just show up and listen, but we showed out in action. We had a policy called 90-10 where 90% of our grading was based on test, testing. And obviously everybody's not a great tester. We want to move the needle in Rockford, but we had to look at how our policies were blocking us. We could not have the lowest graduation, graduation rate and put a bunch of hurdles in the way. So just looking at those type of things, and I've been privileged to have the opportunity to do what I needed to do to move scholars. So at Rockford now, we have a lot of different policies that are in place that are moving the needle. We've, re, we've redone a lot of things. A lot of times when you guys hear the equity word, it's putting up wallpaper and covering up things that still exist. We have to look at our foundation totally different and make sure that each scholar, I don't believe in all, I believe in each, because if you do all, you're still going to get the majority and you're going to miss many scholars. I don't care your race, everybody learns a little different. Everybody has a different pace. Everybody picks up things in a different way. And when we begin to look at each scholar in a different way, we're finally starting to see ourselves move in the direction that that district needs to go in. Our attendance is going up. We're going to graduate scholars at a rate that we haven't done in the last 10 years. So that is my track record. I'm not going to come in and um, a place uh, you know, where people are interviewing me and just come in and know the answer. If you know the answer, then you're wasting time because you haven't listened to the answer. You have to listen to every stakeholder. So I think most of my role, uh, you know, Dr. Jared allows me to function as his mini superintendent. He, everything kind of goes to my team. And he really trusts me. Uh, he's been there for about 10, 11 years. I'm not going to say he's on his way out the door, but uh, he, you know, he's, uh, he's done his thing. So, He's like, hey, man, I want you to, you know, take my place. But I, I've always told Dr. J, you know, I'm not going to come behind you. But while I'm here, you know, we're going to make sure we have uh, one of the best places in the state. So I coach all the principals in the state um, as it relates to curriculum and cultural instruction. I, uh, even my son's schools in Munderland is population similar here, about 96 percent uh, white population. But they are starting to realize diversity is coming to many places that they didn't expect. The superintendent called me and said, hey, look, we, we need some help. You know, we're not doing things the right way. And, uh, you know, we do the work at the state. And uh, scholars do not belong. Belonging is the end of the road. That, that means we've done everything correct. Once you say you have a, a district of belonging, that means we've done a lot of things to get to that space. And so being able to do that with multiple superintendents now has been uh, my new fun thing. Uh, uh, but, you know, now I'm, I'm, I'm ready. I wanted to wait and make sure I did everything right. I worked at elementary. I had a couple K-8 schools. I've got a chance to be in different places. Chicago was interesting and go to South Bend and to Milwaukee. So I've saw education. I've saw enough things to make sure that I was ready when I eventually applied to superintendent role. So uh, Midland, uh, I didn't, I was looking at uh, Michigan because I, I, you know, I knew I, I liked Michigan uh, for a lot of reasons. Uh, some of my family was this way and a lot of my favorite athletes were from Michigan. So I began to apply for jobs and just started applying up, I want to say about a month ago. So I found this place. I wanted to make sure I looked at places that I can bring my, my young scholars uh, because, you know, you know, Chicago is, is Chicago. It's, it's, it's a fast moving place. You know, I, I'm, I'm getting a little older now. I got to slow it down. So I wanted a place that was, uh, you know, a little diverse, uh, close to a lot of other places. I, I, I would go to Detroit a lot when I was in junior college. Shouldn't have been up there. I should have been in football practice, but I was always at Detroit. 
Uh, so, you know, I, I'm very familiar with the area, and so I looked at the opportunity here, your, your size of schools, your two high schools. I'm very familiar with the, uh, the function uh, and things that the, this district is doing, so I was really proud, proud of the opportunity to uh, get a chance to apply here. So I really appreciate you all uh, for taking the time to even have me here. I know it's late. You all are tired. I'm the last one, so thank you all. And that's it on my general and uh, personal. So I'm going to... Yep. Go to number three, because Dr. Rita answered number two for us. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, what strategies have you used or will you use to balance your time in the district versus visibility in the community? So as a superintendent, uh, in the role of superintendent, it is very important that you don't just jump into school to check a box, clap some hands, and walk out the door. Um, in my listening sessions with my teachers, one of the things that I've done is we have a cadence, a calendar of listening and responding. And that was the first thing that the teacher said, hey, we have uh, the same issues. We want to do restorative practice, but we want our own help checked. We want to make sure our mental awareness is looking, looked at. When you're building out your master facility plan, make sure we're at the forefront. So as a superintendent, uh, you know, it was important for me to go to a space that I could do that. I did not want to go back to a place like CPS because it's too many schools and I could not be authentic. I have to be there to inspect what I expect and support this team in a way that I example. So what that looks like for me, it is definitely a balance. You have to have the community stakeholders at hand. And you have to make sure you build that partnership. But for your schools, you have to be in those schools. You can't just be in the schools and walk in and walk back out the door. You have to be there and get embedded in what is going on. You have to see the movement. You have to see the things that you're flushing down. Uh, one of the things I was frustrated with when I got to RPS was, hey, look, we can't say that our curriculum is working until we see it work. So I forced my cabinet to get back into the buildings. And so we have a road show when we're in those buildings on a monthly cadence and we're seeing, you know, it, it's one thing to be at the district, but when you take everybody's role, whether it's HR, whether it's uh, food service, and you get in the buildings and see how they're working out, it takes on a new ownership. So our district does, uh, you know, every three months, we just all share our visits into the building. And that includes our board, you know, one of the things that, you know, I have in my packet, I would have gave you all if I was early, was our board uh, comes to our listening sessions as well. And they sit there and listen to the scholars. And they make sure that the scholars are heard and the parents have a listening session. Our counselors are, you know. So I, I really believe that as a superintendent, that balance is important. But I think it cannot be just a checkbox type of visit. I'm going to do visits because I got to get to seven schools and that's a goal. Now you have to get in schools and you have to be where you need it because some schools are going to need more and you got to see more. You got to learn more. You got to listen more. And I really believe that uh, one of the things that districts don't do a great job of is trusting the scholar. These scholars learned a lot during COVID. They came out picking up skills that we did not recognize. They can learn a lot faster. That chat, GTP, and that, that, uh, what's that new fast stuff, that, that's, that stuff is not going away. It's, it's going to be more embedded in what we do. So I had to say, hey, look, a lot of the stuff that I'm dealing with, with this hidden is coming from this social media. That is a space you've got to include the scholars in. So it's important that the, as, at the superintendent role, you're making, meeting with all stakeholders. And that includes the, the engineer. As a principal, one of my best names was to know the custodial worker and the engineer. They know everything. They know who's coming, who's going. They probably know more than everybody in the building. So it's building those relationships and being in the community. When there are things that are going on in Rockford, I got to be the first one there. And there are events, I got to be there. And you have to show up if you want to show out. You can't say that you're embedded in something if you're not in part of it. So uh, that's just been the norm for me, just to be involved in what, uh, you know, things that are going on in our district. And it, it just has to be a balance of making sure that you're listening to all stakeholders and you're responding, and you're not just checking a box. What is your uh, communication style? How do you plan to communicate with stakeholders in the MPS community, and how will you achieve transparency without exhausting stakeholders with information? Well, we're not going to send 100,000 emails. One of the things I just had to clean up, we had about 10 different channels of emails, and everybody was so important and more important than the next person. you got to clean that up. A principal is busy. They're not going to read those 5,200 emails. You better give them the two big rocks that you want them to take away, and you have to make sure that is clear. You have to give your principals a little space and a little grace in, in today's uh, you know, education realm. We have a new arena that is being built in education. So it's very important that you communicate at the level of the stakeholder you're communicating with. We assume that everybody understands at the level that we, we do here, but sometimes one of the things I found out was really cool is just do videos and send them out get in my little channel because they watch that at, when they want to and they can hear things. And make sure you overly emphasize your big rocks. 
everything cannot be a big rock every week for a principal. Our principals have to make sure they understand what's really important to us as a district, and we have to be crystal clear. One of the things about communication, for me, I have to be crystal clear on what I'm communicating, how I track it, and how I follow up about it, or I'm not going to communicate it. Anything we communicate has to be something we follow up on. And some, some of my districts I've been in, uh, that was something we had to scale back on. We were communicating too much, and we were expecting too much back. That was not clear. So being timely about your communication, making sure you're consistent, you're clear, and making sure you're following up uh, is very important. But I do not have one, uh, one style fits all when it comes to communication. It really depends on the stakeholder I'm communicating with. Obviously with my principals, I have a really authentic relationship with them. I was on my way here and the principal was texting me just, you know, hey, I really appreciate you for empowering me. You have to make sure the principal has your back and you can have theirs. You can hold them accountable, but you have that relationship with them. So I really just believe in having the cadence of communicating with people the way they need to be communicated with, and I don't think that's a one-size-fits-all. One of my principals does not like phone calls. She would be right next to the phone. I have to text her. Hey, make sure we're doing such and such, such. So you just have to learn that. That's something you learn um, when you're, you're in this job, that everybody communicates differently, including our families. They communicate in a different way. You have to reach them where they're at. Yeah, I, I, when you're looking at money, I, I really believe that you got to invest the money in cultural relevant instruction. You have to make sure that every scholar sees his or herself in the instruction. And that has to make sure it plays out into something they can actually put their hands on. If we continue to lecture the scholars, we're going to continue to lose scholars. And places that are really doing great are going to start to degress. Uh, in our listening sessions with scholars, one of the things they say, hey, we got to put our hands on things. I don't want to learn math in a way that I can't see how it applies. So anything we do, we have to invest, and I think we do a great job if you're looking at career technical education. Uh, Project-based learning also aligns to that. But the curriculum was where you have to put the focus at, and that curriculum is really uh, critical to many of our outcomes. Where we land that curriculum is where I usually find. Um, we lost a lot of ESSER funds. Everybody lost it across America. So we're really retooling and looking at the next five years and where we're going to put the emphasis. And if it's going to be things that I've had to cut back in that district, it's things that are at the top. But it's not going to be the resources, the resources to the scholars. Uh, we realized we were really top heavy. And that's been a tough conversation the last couple of months that I have to scale back. But that's something that we have to do because we have to make sure that our scholars are at the forefront, uh, especially for these next five years. We don't know the projection of what's going to happen. Many districts lost a lot of money that we had up front. Uh, that is not there, uh, you know, this next five years. So we have to re be really attentional about the goals of our district and make sure that we're spending right down to the curriculum and core for our scholars. You talking my MO, that's what I do. Uh, so so I, I really believe in you set that bar high. And you can't set a bar high if you really don't believe. A lot of times everybody say, hey, set the rigor, set it high. But do you really believe that scholar can learn? Do you believe that scholar can learn the same way as any other scholar? And when we're looking at our graduation rates, we always have to be over 90%. That's the minimum. Because once we get to that place, we have a built-out scholar that we should be proud of. And when you see our high school graduates graduate, they should be confident and eager. In some places, you see high school scholars graduate, they're not ready because we did not prepare them. So I, I, I really believe in making sure that we're preparing our scholars for the future. And um, that, that's something that's uh, critical to me is moving scholars no matter where they're at. That comes with belief. And that comes in that classroom. That comes with getting the teachers the tools they need to function on a daily basis. The teachers are the engine. So one of the things that I've prided myself on, if you need your teaching union, I did not do my job. I am your partner. I am there for you. I'm going to listen to you. I'm going to respond. I cannot promise you everything, but I promise you I'm going to listen to you, and we're going to have an understanding. If things are coming from the state, I have to be able to be transparent and say, hey, look, this is not something that we're doing here at Midland. This is something that we have to do as a state. And teachers like that, staff like that. If you don't take your time to explain everything you're doing, you're wasting somebody else's time, and you're going to lose your team. I, I'm really critical on being a coach, and that, that's my background. That's how I started. So I'm going to make sure I coach you up and make sure that we meet each other where we're at. But you have to believe in that scholar, and you have to give that scholar the tools he or she needs to be great at everything that we ask from them. And we have to be transparent, too. We have to have the conversation with the scholars about our school improvement plans and what we're trying to do. How many times have they listened to it 
and been a part of the conversation, especially fifth grade on out. They need to understand and see what we're doing because those scholars, I, I'm telling you, are different pre-COVID to now. That's a different scholar we're dealing with. They learned a lot sitting in those rooms and those uh, spaces that were unique. And, uh, you know, another thing with, you know, talking about building that scholar out is checking the mental health of our uh, temperature. And that's just not the scholar. That's our staff. Because we assume that, you know, those teachers in those classes, that, that pinch and push, especially when we're at a top district, to be great, you got to make sure you give them great tools. What approach would you take to address and remedy achievement gaps between schools within the district? Yeah. So uh, it depends on the grade level, uh, obviously. But one of the things I love to do is, uh, is get on making sure that we have calls and cadence of sharing best practice. If one of my schools is doing great at something, why are we not communicating that across the other schools that need that help? One of the things we have to do is build a bridge between our schools. It cannot be a divide. It's a teacher somewhere that really does good at, at geometry, and it's another teacher somewhere else. But when you don't allow the space for communication, that's when you see the drop off. No matter the culture and the background of that scholar, there are tools that work, and there's somebody that can work that too. So one of the things in CPS I learned was having that Friday call was to share best practice. Not to judge you, not to criticize you, but share best practice. Practice it, play it, go observe it, give that principal space to see it, take those tools back and build a community, a playbook of success is what we need. That, that's indifferent of your school when you have a playbook of success. If we want to know how to build math in a cultural way, we have a playbook for it. If we want to know how to get our scholars on board so that SAT is over 1,100 so we can go to every school, it's a playbook for that. We have to build those playbooks out so it's indifferent of what school we're at. We have a playbook of success. So I think that's something we can do at Midland because we have some schools that really do a great job of things and we have to transfer that that energy and that message. And we have to uh, highlight success. You know, academic success is very important. We got to champion that. It can't just be a, something we do at the board. It has to be something we do on a weekly basis. When a scholar shows up and shows out, we have to champion that. So sharing that best practice across our district is very important, and celebrating our success is very important. When you're at a district, uh, you know, you're in schools, it could be daunting if nobody's celebrating you, nobody's rewarding you, saying you did a great job. You just a, Humanizing of our staff and our, our, our team is very important. And transferring that information across our schools is also something that we can do a great job at. Okay. Thank you. The next question. How will you bring community organizations and governmental agencies together with the school district to create a healthier working and collaborative partnership for the good of the district and the community? I don't want to try to say your last name, Brother Scott, so I'm going to say Brother Scott. That, is, uh, that was something unique to uh, my last couple of places. I just, they probably going to watch it anyways in here. But Rockford was uh, tough because the mayor and my superintendent were here. And when I got there, the first thing I recognized, hey, look, we got common goals. We can't keep the finger pointing. It can't be the school district pointing and saying, hey, if the city does this, we'll get better. And it can't be the city saying, well, if we have good schools, we can be better. And so I finally got us to a place where we're doing things in a, in, a, in a common ground. We share the best interests of the scholar. I think in order to get rid of all that other, you know, politics and policy stuff, we have to get it down to the core of why we're here. Are our scholars okay? Can they show out in our community? So in Chicago, it's different because the mayor kind of runs the district, where in Rockford, when I got there, there was two different entities. So one of the things we have to do is find common grounds of trust. Usually when you have those two different spaces, somebody is not trusting somebody. We have some things we have to repair. So right now, what we're doing in Rockford, we have a commonality goal of uh, we, we have looking at domestic violence in our homes and making sure that that's something that we worked on together, that our scholars are coming to school, they can talk about things they see at homes, and that we are looking at building roads and pathways in our, to our schools, uh, safe passage. Uh, those safe passage things were not in our community before. We couldn't even have, we're expecting scholars to come to school and have high attendance. We don't have proper roads. So if the city is still arguing with the superintendent and we're not working together, I, they needed a neutral source that didn't give a care about none of that. I only cared about our schools having the interest of getting to school. I only cared about them being great. So you can get rid of all that when you get to the core of why we're doing this. Uh, the, the city works for the scholar. The school district does the same. Our families need to see greatness, so we have to work together. I think getting common ground and building trust and walking across that line that, on things that we agree that we can work together on uh, is, is, is working for us. We're building a great relationship. We have a healing center framework now that we're working out across our district that allows our teachers to even get support. 
So I, I think that's something that I've had to learn, that it, it functions different depending on how the mayor works with the superintendent and things of that nature. But I've been privileged to see both sides of how that should look. But at the end of the day, it has to get down to what we're doing for the scholar. Thank you. How have you held your leadership team or staff accountable for their roles and responsibilities? Please provide any examples. Yeah, so you know, one of the things that uh, we started this school year with is hearing a lot of, of, of what we uh, were perceiving were effective measures for our scholars. Starting with, we had a policy of the graduation rate. And we would hear that, hey, we got these newcomers coming in, these, these scholars that are coming in from various countries, and, and uh, we were treating them the same as every other scholar. Now, how can a scholar speak in Swahili, and we only have Hispanic speakers, uh, be successful in our district? How can they graduate when we have a bar? We had a bar of 45 credits when our state required 32. So, uh, you know, you got to be able to have that conversation. And, and, and a part of that conversation, you have to be authentic. You have to observe what you need to have that conversation with. Because when you're at that cabinet level, the deputy chief level, and we all are super, assistant superintendents, we all aspire. So your egos can kind of get in the way. So you have to build that relationship with that person. You have to make sure that person understands the goal of the scholars. And you have to have that tough conversation. So one of the things that we have to look at is, hey, were we creating hurdles to damage our own graduation rate? Why do we jump from a 32 graduation requirement to every scholar to, from four to 45? That's been something we've had to change in our policy. And getting our team out in the buildings and seeing what we wanted to see done, inspecting what we expected was one of the most important things to hold it accountable. As it relates to the principal, that, that comes with a relationship. You cannot uh, have a I got you moment with your principal, where your principal is thinking in week 10 and they're doing an awesome job and they're not aligned to the things that we're doing at the district. That has to be a cadence of feedback that you give to your principals, to the rest of your team. And, you know, as a superintendent, that is something that, you know, you've got to be able to have that tough conversation in the right way. You don't want to lose your team, but you also want to keep them focused on the goals that we have set. And those goals, like I said, they have to start the year by being, by being clear. When you don't have clear goals, it's hard to hold scholars and staff and principals and cabinet members accountable because your goals are not clear. So, once we have clear expectations, we've been able to change a lot of our own policies, our own practices that have gotten in the ways of, you know, gotten in the way of scholars graduating, gotten in the way of us having an authentic curriculum that was meant for each scholar. So it was a good conversation, and it's not, it's not going to always be pretty. Sometimes those conversations are going to be tough. But if you've got a good relationship with each other and you really believe that everybody really authentically cares about the scholar, you can have those conversations. You're going to have to have them if you want to get to a certain space. So, They've been tough on some part of our, uh, you know, my team, and they've, you know, been not a, so tough on, a, a, on some of our team. And I will tell you the part of my team that is not tough with is the part that's in the building and see how they work. They're seeing how their work is playing out. So now I have most of my cabinet back inside the, of our schools. Uh, you can't implement anything unless you've inspected how it's working in the school. So that is the new norm for us, and uh, that's the way we're going to continue to go for the rest of this year and, and, and the foreseeable future. All right. Aging infrastructure is a concern. Older and outdated buildings across the district need attention and renovations. As a superintendent, what is the best way to approach this topic with the community? How do you determine which needs, uh, which needs exist and mm -hmm. what the community will support in terms of po passing a bond? Yeah, it depends on where we are as a community. We, just, uh, we were not taking a levy uh, for the last few years because we had COVID money. That's the taxes. We were not even taking it. And we had the same issue. Our ESSER funds were redoing some of our stadiums and, and things of that nature. Uh, we recognized that, you know, we had to do it in an equitable way. And so I think the best way to go about that is having that conversation with the community and not for the community. We have to bring them to the table with these conversations. The more I do it with the community and not for the community, the things I want to get done can get done. I think uh, a lot of times we just do things and we know what we want to do before we listen. And anytime you do that, it's going to be tough to pass things. I've learned as a principal, as managing my district, that I kind of scaffold the room before I implement anything. I kind of know what everybody's thinking before I implement and talk about it. So I've kind of felt everybody out, and I've kind of cleared a misconception behind the scenes before we start doing things out publicly. And marketing things that you want to do is very important. I think one of the best things we're doing now with our pathways and things is marketing. We're trying to do, uh, you know, the right things by our scholars. And you have to market that. You have to sell to people's emotions because people really care about winning. 
And if you're doing things that's winning when you're having that conversation, people get on board. Now, property taxes is a whole different ballgame. I don't care if you're raising it by two cents or two dollars. Raising it is raising it. So when, you, when you're talking about raising property taxes or doing things different, that's a conversation you have to have once again with your, your community, with your, your churches, with your stakeholders. And I've, I've allowed them to have that conversation on the forefront for me because we wanted to do a lot of things over the next five years. Um, in Rockford, we're going to build a, a, a couple of K-8 through eight centers because we want that curriculum to flow all the way K-8. through eight. Um, We've got CKLA and new curriculum that is stagnant at middle school. Middle school has been a struggle, so we have to get that middle school back in line. And so building those you know, K-8 through eight systems is going to require, require us to take the levy, the taxes. We're going to take it on new property. But I had already got the feel from the community on what that would look like. So when we're voting on that, we kind of know we're going to pass the vote. We've already, you know, kind of scaffolded the room, and we know we're going to get there. So then, yeah, we got to go from new, you know, just new property to new things down the road. We're ready to do that as well. But the key is doing things with and not for. Repeat that one, one more time. From, from My mic wasn't on, I'm sorry. What is the level of involvement and participation of certain employees in organizational decisions, and how do you determine what groups to include and when? It depends on the decision, but all stakeholders need to have a voice. And if you, the level of their voice is important because when you eliminate voice, uh, you, you silo people. Now, it depends on the decision. Once again, um, when you're making decisions, you, you do have some conversations that you pre-package before you get them out. But I don't believe in eliminating stakeholders from, you know, trans if we say we're transparent, then how, do, how are we transparent? We, never, we can't say we're transparent to who. It has to be to all. It has to be to every stakeholder in our district. Now, whether that's a survey or a listening and response session or town halls, different ways to do that because it's time consuming. Surveys do not give back authentic results. If I'm taking a survey, it's usually because I'm frustrated about something most of the times. And everybody that I need to hear, I don't get it. So you have to do that in a layered way. But I, I do not believe in uh, siloing anybody's voice in our district. We have to get it from everybody in, in, in a certain uh, way, especially depend, depending on the decision that we're making. Uh, you, you would be surprised about how many people really hear and care about things when you bring it and give them the opportunity to care. Right. Wow, man, I've had a lot of those, I'll tell you. <laughs> I don't, I, you know, in that role, you know, you're not going to make decisions people like, but you got to make the, what's the decisions that are right for the scholars. I think the, the, the decision that was probably the toughest for us to accept uh, was getting rid of the 90-10 policy. We, we, 90 10 uh, was meant to do right, but it was not flushed out the right way. It was not rolled out correctly, so in, in our district, I heard from every stakeholder, hey, th this is not working. And this was from the Fluent Scholar. We have one of the top schools in the whole state was even saying the same thing. Hey, look, this is not working. Uh, and it was a tough conversation because it's one of my, you know, teammates, and I have to let her, you know, know that, hey, look, that policy rolled out, but it was not rolled out with the attention of each scholar in this district. And people are falling behind. And the scholars are just drowning, the teachers are drowning. And when you flush things out and you don't get information from people, that's usually what happens. You think, and because it was done in a vacuum, that people are going to accept it. And you say it's a proven uh, and viable curriculum, but it, for who? For our ego or for the, for the team that we're serving? And so to, to do that, you do have to confront the issue of, hey, where did this come from? Who do we listen to? And what is the data saying? Once you get to the data, that is the key for me. You can say what you want to say, but if the data is showing that what we're implementing is not working, we have to look at that data and we have to pivot. One of the best things you can do is be a reflective leader. You're going to try some stuff that's not going to work, and you have to be reflective. And I have to be vulnerable myself and give an example of when I did something that didn't work and say, hey, look, I jumped out and tried to do such and such, such, such at a large scale, and it did not work. But we stopped, we pivot, we talked about it together, and that worked for us, right? And so selling that to the team is the reason we are – kind of redoing that 90-10 to be more equitable to our district and our scholars. And if I were to do it over again, 
I, I, I think I would just make sure I, I understood the policies that came before they got rolled out. I think we got a wind up when we started to hear about it. We should have known about that um, before it got all the way to the scholars and we're looking at, uh, you know, uh, classes that are failing. We don't have it going on now because we are, you know, we were trying to curve it, but it was too late. Scholars got that pinch of anxiety of everything I do is about the test. I don't have to do homework so I can miss most of the semester and show up and pass the test and I pass your class and that was frustrating teachers. So uh, the data was showing it wasn't working. We had to redo it and we had to do it over. So I don't think I would do it over again. I would just jump ahead of it earlier and be on the forefront of things that are going out, um, you know, before they get down to the scholars. All right, switching gears just a little bit. Um, how do you view the board superintendent relationship and how would you keep board members informed and communicate with us as superintendent? You know, I, I, that, that's everything to your role, uh, your relationship with your, um, your board. And I've always taught myself that the, the respect you give to the people that you know you work for, you're gonna get that back. So, you know, watching our board, we, we revamped, everybody was up for re-election. And we got out to a little rocky start, rocky start I'll say that. Uh, we did an IDI, intellectual inventory, uh, you know, where we are on our journey. And that really helped us because that journey, that IDI, allows you to look at how your board is thinking. Uh, it's important for me to know how everybody thinks. Everybody on the board does not have the same passion. We may think we do, but it's, a, it's somebody that's really good at the, the numbers. It's somebody that's good at human resources. It's somebody that has a passion on that board. You find that passion, you learn that passion from your board. And that relationship with your, you know, your, your, your board president is very important. You gotta know what your board president is thinking. And at the end of the day, I want my president and my team to look good. And I want them to make me look good too. So we gotta develop that relationship. It takes time. It takes tough conversation in the right way. But it takes understanding what everybody's passionate about and what tools they bring to the table and plan it out. Um, we're fortunate now that we got into a case we have a, a board governance training where you know our board works in, in partnership with part of our superintendent cabinet so some of our board members work on the curriculum so they're informed so keeping them informed our team presents to our board consistently we have uh, you know our, 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 our stakeholder meetings when we get away and just talk about things and we make sure they're ahead of everything and you don't do it uh, reactively you make sure everything you do as a superintendent is proactive you don't ask your superintendent for forgiveness. That's not the role you can do that in. You have to make sure that your, uh, you know, uh, you know, your board is aware of what you're thinking when you're thinking it, and give them the, you know, the the chance to look at your stuff while you're thinking it out. I think that's something I think Dr. Jared does a great job of. He's taught me, hey, look, if you don't got your board, I mean, you don't got your union, you're out there by yourself. So you don't want to be out there by yourself. So I think it's very important that we have a cadence of communication, that we have those stakeholder meetings, that we come together and just talk about what we're thinking, our ideals and that we align the passion of our board members um, with what we're doing in our schools. And it's also important that the board members see and celebrate our success because you all have a tough job. You take on a lot of policies. A lot of things come at your way. Um, but you guys uh, are, are doing an awesome job in the climate that we have after COVID and uh, I, to be in your position is, is not an easy position. I, I see the emails that some of my teammates get on our board and you know, uh, I've gave them a space that they can respond. So one of the things that was really important is getting my board members to those listening sessions. So we, did, we asked the scholars, say, what was the one thing you would do if you was the principal? And giving them a chance to have a dialogue with the scholars is a beautiful thing. Uh, I, I, one of my board members said, I wish I could do this all the time. But making our board look good is important because at the end of the day, they, they, they have the, a lot of weight on them as well. The, the superintendent has a lot of weight, but that weight can be lessened when you do it with your board. Dr. Reed, that concludes our uh, pre-typed up questions, so thank you for your responses on those. Um, what questions do you have for us? And then I'll turn it over to my fellow board members to ask any follow-up or continue the conversation. Well, you know, uh, you know, just looking at our data, first of all, it was really a struggle to find our data. I had to look at a lot of places. I, I, I finally found everything I was looking for. but. What, what do we see as our opportunity for growth for our district? If we were to name the one thing that we feel is our opportunity for growth, what is it? I would say um, establishing our foundation at the early elementary level, especially mm -hmm. around literacy. And um, just last week, we listened to a presentation from 
uh, Mr. Brutin on, on school data, and we do a really good job of growing our students once they're in our system, and we see our progressive test scores go up and up as we go, but we'd love to be able to work uh, even more on establishing the foundation at the pre-primary pre through third grade uh, level, especially around literacy. Thank you. I, that's very important. I think that pre-K is where we put a lot of emphasis in Illinois as well. We're recognizing that that you know that scholar jumping in early is uh, paying dividends for us. Uh, once you get to that middle school, that's that's, that's where it gets <laughs> unique. You got to get them way before that middle school. I'll tell you that. Yep. Um, my next question: I, I, I looked at our district and we we, we talked about the, our equity for all. What is our true equity imperative? What is our goal with equity? What do we really want to get out of uh, the equity work for our district? So I'm happy to answer that, but anybody else? Okay. Um, I'm going to use my own words because you talked about authenticity, and um, the only way that I know how to respond to that is, is to, to utilize my own words. When I think about equity in our district, it's creating a sense of belonging for our students, and every student must feel like they belong in our classroom first before they can learn. And whether that is from a place of um, taking away barriers to taking away the barriers that prevent them to get to school, um, eliminating hunger in the morning, uh, making sure that other students appreciate the background of that student in the classroom and can appreciate where they're coming from such that they're um, recognized for who they are and recognize their background. Um, that's the mission of equity because it's in service of proficiency and growth uh, from an academic standpoint for our students. Okay. And I would say down the road, our students need to come to school and see people that look like them. Um, it's no secret that this isn't the most diverse area, but it is becoming more diverse, our community is, and students need to see that in school where they're going every day and spending most of their time. So that's a good question. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. Uh, and just to piggyback on that, what is the need that our community, if our community was to speak on Midland, what would the community say about our school district? Cool. Um, anybody else want to go first? <laughs> I think um, a, a couple things. One is we've done a, I think we've done a really good job of starting to engage our parents more and more. Um, you know, school is not a place anymore where our culture allows us to just send kids to school and, and you expect that they come home educated, but rather that parents are part of the educational journey and continuing to find ways to engage our parents um, in that learning process, I think is, is a point of focus when we think about the community. Second, um, our community is changing. Um, our large corporate headquartered company is no longer the largest employer in town, and our, I think our our em, empl, um, our businesses need different employees in the future, and making sure that we adapt our students such that they're successful members of our community uh, as they graduate um, from our our school system whether they take a CTE route, go direct into the workspace, go into the military, or go on to post-secondary education, we need to think about how we're adapting fast enough to keep up with our business community and anticipating the needs of, of our community as it grows and evolves. I would also add that our community is extremely supportive of our school district and our students. Um, and that we um, need to not take that for granted. Um, we share our appreciation all the time, but I think that we also depend on that um, support a lot. And so making sure that that is a, 
a two-way relationship that we're giving to our community as much as they're um, giving back to us. Appreciate that answer. Uh, I just believe in, uh, you know, saying multiple cities that you, we got to keep all the doors open for our scholars. And I love CTE, uh, project-based learning, but we still have to believe that our scholars from day one have the aptitude to go to college. We have to keep that. Uh, I watch many district when you remove that, when the door is closed, it's closed. You don't have a choice but to do other things. I want all five doors open for every scholar uh, from the time they step in to the time they leave. So that's very important. And I guess my last question, because I can stay here all night, uh, I drive with something else, so I'm not ready to do it again. So, But uh, if you guys had the opportunity to build an ideal candidate for Midland, what would that candidate look like? What would the attributes be? Um, well, I think we outlined them pretty well in the the HYA application, um, and we did that through our, our community involvement. Um, and I think it's somebody, uh, maybe to paraphrase, is focused on authentic, uh, to your point earlier, authentic conversations around how we grow every student, um, meet them where they are, and be able to articulate that to our community members in a way that we all understand. I mean, maybe the seven of us are a little bit more educated about the educational system than, than uh, our community members, but it's not, it's not much, right? And we're still learning every day as board members and figuring out how to communicate that back to, to our community is, is really important. Um, and selling the district. Second, I would say, you know, it's somebody that's focused on our students and staff. And as you said, you know, our teachers are the ones that have the most impact on proficiency and growth and making sure that we have a candidate that has their back but can also hold them accountable at the same time is, is probably the most uh, important attribute when we think about a, a candidate. Um, I'm gonna look to my fellow board members on any follow-up questions that we have. I would also say we're at a pretty big transition point in some of the decisions that we need to make um, visioning and looking forward. Um, and so that is definitely something that our ideal candidate um, has is the ability to have those communication with the community and help kind of bridge all the different conversations to get the entire community and district where we need to go for the future. Um, Dr. Reed, one of the questions I had, maybe going back to why you're interested in MPS, is mm -hmm. your experience has been tied to relatively large cities in comparison to Midland, even Rockford mm -hmm. is three times the size, or maybe even more. But um, what attracts you to, to move into a smaller community, smaller district? That's easy, uh, because I can get to places. I cannot get to all the schools like I want to in Rockford and be there for my teachers and see the needs that they have. I want to see the pre-K. They told me this little pre-K, they hitting already. I said, no, they can't be hitting that pre-K. But I got to get in there. So when I get in there and the pre-K is hitting for real, I got to make sure we put in supports there earlier. So when I'm in a larger district, that, that's doable. But it's daunting because it involves me being there. And I don't show up and just check a box and get out. I like to be in a space now that I can be there and, and, and be a fly on the wall, but a support on the wall. And I can coach you where you got to go. Be behind the scenes supporting your principal. Make your principal shine. It's tough to do. I'm not saying it's not doable. One of the reasons I did not go back into CPS was that reason. is You don't see your work get done. It's, I like to see my work get all the way down to the scholar. And that's why I want to be in a district that allows me to do that. South Bend was probably the most fun for me, Central, because I got to see my work getting done down to the scholar. And I got to see teachers, uh, you know, be attentional about showing up and feel like they're winning. And it, that is what draws me here. It's, it's just the right size. Yes, Rockford is about three times the size. I got a couple of charters. I got everything everywhere. Uh, but I want to focus in. And I think when you really focus and really target it, you see really great wins. And uh, that, that is what I want at this point in my career. What haven't you told us that you think we need to know today 
about your about yourself. Oh, okay, I'm about to say I got a lot of stuff. Yeah. I'm telling you, we'd be here all night now. How long yeah, you want to be here now? <laughs> all right, but you know, uh, I, I think uh, I'm very competitive. I, I I have a son that plays Division One football. I still think I can beat him and everything, but he, he he's a lot bigger than me now. So, uh, but I don't want us to be in a place where we don't uh, celebrate our success and champion each other. I watch you all interact as a board, and I really like that. I. I'm not going to say I could go where I want, but I wanted to be in a place like I saw you are in Iraq. You all had tough conversations. I watched your board member meetings back from about November just to see how you all interacted with each other. And that was important to me because you don't want to be in a board, you know, when your board is everywhere. And you all have a chance to each speak. There's nobody just, you know, trumping the conversation with nobody. So I really enjoy watching your board governance. It's another thing that drew me here. But I think my competitive nature is what I bring because I believe in every scholar. I don't care where the scholar comes from. I think one of the things about me, uh, you know, I had a, a, a different type of upbringing where, you know, I, I didn't have choices. I, the choice was laid out in front of me. But to give a scholar a choice means a lot to me. And to compete with every scholar and every teacher means a lot. Because at this point in education, we're losing people. Because we're not losing people because the education is, is boring. We're losing people because we are not humanizing the people that are in our places, and just making them feel who they are. You are human. You're going to go through things. You're not going to be your best every day. And how do I show up for you at that moment? It's very important to me. So that competitive nature, being a coach, uh, that's always going to come out of me. Uh, you know, to this day, that's just what drives me. I believe in everybody because somebody believed in me. I probably wouldn't be sitting here. I should not be sitting here coming from where I come from. But since I'm here, i got to be authentic with who I am. I don't show up to code switch. I become the code. And that's just what it is with me, and that's my competitive nature. You asked about the ideal candidate. Um, we want somebody that's going to come in and, and, and be a team player with us. We have phenomenal teachers in this district. Mm -hmm. We have a great infrastructure with our administration. We are not without challenges. One of those challenges we've kind of talked about a little bit, and you probably, if you watch our board meetings back through November, you would have seen a, a presentation by Brian in a December where we talked about some potential opportunities of where we may be headed as a district when we're talking about our, our next bond. We could go traditional, staying with two high schools, or we could go something very different and in going into one high school. Um, what is your comfort level? I know you don't know this community yet, but you will uh, quickly if, if this is the job for you. Mm -hmm. What is your comfort level going out to a community and going and selling and talking to them about a very large investment, a, a, a bond that could be somewhere in the, for mm -hmm. us, is a huge dollar amount would be like a $300 million bond. Mm -hmm. The good thing, I've had that conversation a couple of times. Um, with West Allis, we wanted to combine the two schools into one school. We wanted to win in sports. I'm just going to be honest with you. The mother schools had the, you know, bigger schools. Uh, J.J. Watts and them were out there. His schools were big. And so we like, man, we're not going to be able to compete with them. So just like we just had that conversation, being authentic about what we're doing, sometimes you're scared to do that. And when you don't do that authentically, People start to see through your inability to be authentic, and they don't support you. I, I just believe in being totally transparent about what we want to do and the why. When you sell the why with data, you get people on board with you. When you don't sell the why with, with the data, it's, it's a tough. You can't mm -hmm. just sell it with emotion. Um, but I think that's very important that when you're looking at those decisions, you do not do it with, once again, you got to do it for. You got to get out there and listen. You got to get into all the spaces. I, I, we get, one of the things about Midland, you all have a lot of churches, so that was one of the things I was thinking about. How am I going to get to all these churches? We have a lot of churches. Yes. I said, wow. Because I ain't got a lot of churches in Rock, but I know my 10 churches. I know the pastors. But I said, man, it's, I, I, I cannot even count how many churches I saw. So, but that's important. I, I, you know, I, you know the, being in the spaces where you can listen to people and showing up and giving them spaces, bringing them to you and also giving them time to listen because a lot of times you can't go to 100 places. You can bring 100 spaces to you. And you can get that listening session done. You can also put them in front of your scholars. When you're making these big decisions, where were your scholars at? What was their voice? How did they feel about it? I'm going to tell you one of the biggest sales that I've always had is why we didn't combine the schools was the scholars said no. And guess who influences their parents? Those scholars. 
So those guys, this ain't going to work. This is not what we want. And the, scholar, the parents were saying the same thing. So knowing your scholars and knowing the stakeholders that you're dealing with is very important. But being authentic. And, and you're not going to win everybody. You know that, right? You're not going to make everybody happy. You're not going to do that in this business. And are you okay waking up with your team that you see in front of you with the decisions you made? Because if you were wavering, you're going to get hit on both sides. But when you're strong as a team, you're going to do what you got to do. And you're going to keep it moving forward. I think that was my time to go. That's it. That's our time. That's our time. All right. That was just to make sure to keep us on track. Yeah, so yes, that's sir. That's our time. Well, thank you very much for coming in today. Mm -hmm. it, you know, interviewing is tough, especially doing it publicly. So mm -hmm. really appreciate you and, and you coming to apply for this position and, and uh, interview with us. So thank you. Thank you all for having me. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> so, I think we need to extend. Um, we do. We, we can't go past nine thirty without a motion. Right. Okay. Um. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. So, as a board, I think we should take in what we just discussed. Um, we have the opportunity to invite any combination of the three candidates back for a day in the district and second round interviews. Um, I, if there are. I am very, I try to be very respectful of people's time. I don't want to invite anybody back that the board doesn't think has a fair shot at getting to the next uh, round, um, I, you know, when you, when you think about all three candidates. I'm also happy to invite all three back if that's what the board really wants to see. Um, however, it's 918, if we need to extend, if we need to we will need to extend, I think, um, which requires a motion and, and vote of the whole board. So um, if, if there's a motion on the table, I would accept the motion to, to extend till give ourselves plenty of time till 1030 and we could take like a five minute break, um, grab another water, use the restroom, whatever, um, and then come back here at, at 925 to get started. Come back on Wednesday. Sir. I, I like so, Wednesday personally because it gives me a little bit of time to yeah. chew on this okay. before I to have a more I think coherent conversation. I move, I move we come back on Wednesday. So okay. When we come back on Wednesday, one other thing that we um, or if we're going to come back on Wednesday, I should be careful how I say that since we haven't voted on that. <laughs> Um, if we come back on Wednesday, we should discuss a little bit about how we want that to function. Should we use a selection matrix? Should we, right, do you guys want to individually think about it? And then when we start the, the Wednesday session, we deliberate on how to set it up and make our selection. What are your, your thoughts? I think delving into this a little bit will at least maybe for me, give me a little more clarity so when when we come back, we can set the parameters, I think, more effectively for that matrix uh, and then talk through it. And it shouldn't take a tremendous amount of time. Yeah. Okay. Just my opinion. So just so I had double check, John, you made the motion to uh, come back Wednesday. Motion by Lauterbach, support by Farland. Any other further discussion yeah. on coming back Wednesday? The the only other question is we have room for all three of them to come back for a day in the district. We do. Okay. Yep. And so, every, so we have we have a couple different potential options with yeah. that HYA has given to Sarah. Um, whether we invite one, two or three back, we can schedule it 
uh, accordingly based on kind of their template and rubric for day in the district. Any other questions or discussion? Time on Wednesday. What are you thinking for a start time? It's set for 5.30. It's, it's set for 5.30. So is that, you want to stay with that time? It, it works for me. Can we? I don't think we can change it. Okay. Yeah, it's already been we have, publicized. I think it requires 48 hours. Okay. So yeah. we, yeah, John's right. We wouldn't have time yeah. to change it. Yeah. It's, it's already Cut. been publicized. Yeah. All right, so the um, motion on the table is to start 5.30 on Wednesday, and at the beginning of that discussion, we'll set out the framework and template for how we want to make our selection. Okay. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Um, before we adjourn, um, please remember to fill out feedback if you have it on each of the candidates uh, if you watch online please provide feedback to the board email um, and then we will see everybody Wednesday have a motion to adjourn I'll move to adjourn I'll support motion by McFarland support by Hatfield all in favor say aye aye, aye. aye. stand adjourned